being held compared to fashion uh, as is uh, allowed under state legislation. Um, we are also uh, have conducting a public hearing on two uh, ordinance revisions. Uh, well, one is an ordinance revision, the other is a new ordinance. Uh, so first order of business is Pledge of Allegiance. Charles? I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. 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 Thank the uh, uh, public hearing has been noticed, uh, and I'll just leave um, the notice. Notice is hereby given for selecting the whole public hearing on July 18, 2022, uh, at 8 a.m. Um, at the Gilbert Town Hall and via Zoom. Uh, the purpose of this uh, public hearing is to obtain public comment and consider an enactment of an ordinance to amend the code of the Town of Gilbert, Chapter 208 Noise, and an ordinance to regulate all terrain vehicles, ATVs. And copies of the proposed ordinance amendments are on file and available uh, in the town clerk's office. Uh, all interested persons are invited to attend and be heard. Written communications will be received for uh, entry into the record. Uh, to date, uh, we've only received one, uh, and that was uh, from the Conservation Commission. Uh, and then the notice is uh, published pursuant to Section 3 4 uh, 8 of the Charter of the Town Clerk. With that, um, let's open up uh, the first of the two being the uh, uh, chapter uh, 208, the noise ordinance. As uh, I think you, you may recall, we uh, went through this routine uh, several months ago. And uh, based on the reaction and some feedback we got uh, from staff as well as the community, uh, we have uh, uh, redefined uh, what we were looking to change. Uh, and uh, what you have in front of you, the summary uh, shows the, the, the three basic changes. And this is in the exemption side. Uh, noise generated by any construction equipment which is operated during daytime hours, except no such exemption shall apply after 7 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. And noise generated by construction equipment during nighttime hours and after 7 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays shall not exceed the maximum noise levels as specified in 208-5B. Uh, and number three, uh, noise and domestic power equipment, such as but not limited to power source, sanders, grinders, lawn, and garden tools, similar devices operating during daytime hours, except no exemption shall apply after 7 p.m. on Saturdays uh, and Sundays. And five, noise and demolition work conducted during daytime hours, except no such exemption shall apply after 7 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. And considered emergency work demolition shall be exempted at all times from the noise level set this regulation. Uh, Pete, um, if, if you wouldn't mind commenting uh, briefly uh, on uh, uh, what was changed since the last time we talked about this. Um, yeah, I think it was a much broader um, attempt at uh, um, amendment last time. So this is a much more focused. Uh, this came, as you know, Matt, this came out of the first selectman's office and uh, basically was initiated, as I understand, from a complaint about construction noise on the weekends. So this is uh, really what we're trying to address in this. Um, uh, the construction, domestic power equipment, and demolition work were completely exempt prior to this from any uh, noise ordinance during daylight hours. And so rather than make them completely exempt, we've and, and that exemption ended at 10 p.m. at night, including on the weekends. So all this does is say, well, you, you know, that type of noise will continue to have the exemption, but that exemption ends at 7 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. Now, that doesn't mean that type of work or noise can't be generated. You just have to comply with the same uh, noise restrictions as any other type of, um, of noise. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pete. Any uh, comments or questions from board members? It's clear. Yeah, I, I do have one. So okay. is it a cor correct interpretation that people can't mow their lawns past 7 p.m. on the weekends? No, it's, no, it's not. Explain that to me, please. All right, so um, the noise, uh, well, I guess it depends on the amount of noise that's generated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, 
if it, it if it were to violate the daytime uh, noise levels that's in the ordinance, then um, yes, technically, then it would. That's correct. Uh, but I don't I don't really have that full understanding of what level of noise is generated. By lawnmowers. By lawnmowers, <laughs> right. So I just yeah, forgive me. I don't really know how 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 many decibels my lawnmower puts out, but I, I just would like to have assurance that people can still do normal yard work. You know, people who work all week and and are, are busy and and might need those extra couple hours to mow their lawns. I I want to feel comfortable that people can still continue to to do that. Okay, understood. Um, I, you know, Chief, are you on? Um, maybe you could comment on whether a, a lawnmower would you know would violate the no, noise ordinance. I'm not familiar enough with with the decibel levels, frankly. Right, and I and I don't think it would, but. Uh... The, the the difficulty there is measuring uh, how that's how those decibels are supposed to be measured. Right. Uh, that's a piece of equipment that's moving; it's not standing still. Uh, so you know the decibel levels as it moves across the yard get get louder or much less depending on where it is in the yard, mm -hmm. based on the distance uh, away from the people that are hearing it. So it it, it should not be an issue with the decibel levels. Okay. Well, if, if there's any doubt at all, I, I would like to see that somehow accepted from the exception to the exception here. All right. So let me let me. My, yeah. So let me throw this out there then. Um, and I, I don't advocate for these. I just draft them. Yeah, yeah understand. <laughs> I, have, I have no problem. Uh, so the for instance, if you look at the language in there, um, you could say, all right, no, no domestic power equipment is going to be affected and just leave that the way it's been, enjoying the exemption completely till 10. Or you can say this amendment still applies to power saws, sanders, grinders, but take out the lawn and garden tools just as an option. Or, or you know, we can remove the entire change with respect okay. to domestic power equipment. So I'll leave right. that to you folks. Okay. All right. Anything further, Sue? Um, I, yeah, I don't know at what point we would discuss how to do that, but yes, okay. I'd like to do one of those things. Okay, uh, we will have the opportunity later in the agenda when we uh, go to act on it. So, okay. perfect. Thank uh, you. Anyone, anyone from the public wishing to opine on this ordinance? All right. Hearing none, let's move on to the second. And that is an ordinance to regulate all-terrain vehicles, ATVs. And uh, this is uh, uh, something that I think uh, has generated a significant amount of discussion and attention uh, with the Guilford Land Conservation Trust, uh, as well as Conservation Commission. And uh, Janet Ainsworth, thank you for the letter that you uh, sent along supporting uh, the adoption of this, uh, this ordinance. Uh, I also know Kevin McGee uh, has been supportive of this uh, type of activity. Uh, and, and it's largely, I think, around the fact that uh, it's very difficult to regulate uh, the illegal use of ATVs, particularly on uh, land conservation uh, trust property. If I'm not mistaken, uh, it's, it, it creates some, uh, some damage and it is a, a public nuisance as well. Uh, would either uh, Kevin or Sarah want to comment on that? Well, with Janet, she wants for conservation before I jump in first, or? Uh, this is Spencer Meyer from the Land Trust. I'm here too when it's my turn. Oh, Spencer, okay. Yeah, I didn't, uh, don't, didn't recognize the uh, telephone number. Is Spencer, now a good time? Yes, it's uh, very appropriate. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry for the uh, not great connection that doesn't support video, but um, some of you know what I look like. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'm the president of the Guilford Land Conservation Trust. My colleague, Sarah, uh, is in the audience, I believe, as well. And uh, as you did already allude to, we are very much in favor of this ordinance. We have had continual problems um, with ATVs and other motorized vehicles on our various properties, particularly in North Guilford. Um, and we think this, uh, this ordinance is really great and is going to help. I would point out one thing that uh, Kevin McGee has, has already brought up, I believe, and that is we do have problems with some vehicles that are so-called street legal, 
but also our four by fours like pickup trucks and Jeeps and things like that, that um, are part of our problem as well. And it's not clear to me if this ordinance explicitly would um, apply to those kinds of vehicles, at least in our case on private land. So we would be interested in having the language expanded a little bit to include vehicles that are otherwise registered, but should not be allowed on private land without written permission. Um, with that caveat aside, we are very much in support of this ordinance, and we thank you for bringing it up. Uh, you're welcome, Spencer. Uh, Spencer, in the definition section of the ordinance, uh, it, uh, it, I don't know if this addresses your concern. It's all-terrain vehicles means a self-propelled vehicle designed to travel over unimproved terrain is defined in Connecticut General Statutes 14379, which has been determined by the Commissioner of Motor Vehicles to be unsuitable for operation on public highways. So that probably doesn't cover it for you. Uh, Right. I, I think I correct. I think that's right. And, you know, a regular sort of pickup truck that the state would consider very much uh, OK on highways also at times are violating our, our trespassing on our land and, you know, Jeeps and things like that. And so I don't know the right way to write it, but um, uh, somehow, at least in the private land section, saying some other classes also are required to have written permission from the private landowner uh, before being used. Um. Well, if I can jump in here for a moment, this is attorney Thomas Cusa. Oh, thank you. With, with Sussman Duffy. Yeah. Uh, just this ordinance is largely drawn from the enabling statute under the Connecticut General Statutes, which allows the, the local town to regulate the use of ATVs and other sorts of things. As far as it doesn't necessarily empower you to, as you say, whether you want to expand this reg or possibly do a different reg with regard to, as you say, Jeeps, uh, you know, four by you know, basically the type of you know, pickup trucks, that sort of thing. This ordinance is primarily drawn, allowing you to just pulling directly from the state statute. Uh, as far as so, if you say as far as the definition, that is really coming from the Connecticut General Statute. So, how, as you say, if I, I understand there's an issue. I mean, I believe there there is another ordinance. I don't have my notes in front of me. Dealing with uh, basically with you saying not you're not allowed to dr drive uh, vehicles in undesignated areas with regard to like parks and such. Right? Again, I'd have to check my notes to see exactly what ordinance that was. But as you say, how you I understand the problem, but how you go about getting there. I honestly have to put some more thought, or as you say, whatever the board wishes to, whatever angle the board wishes to pursue, or whatever idea Peter might have. Hey, thank, thank you, Tom. Um, so, so those of you who have met Tom before is with Sussman Duffy. It's, it's a uh, firm that I'm associated with, uh, and he did the draft. We use the North Brantford model as a template um, and worked off of that and made some modifications as we thought were appropriate. Um, and it came to us as a request for actually to, a, to try to adopt the North Brantford model. So that's why we stayed so close to it. But I think Tom's point is, is well taken that, you know, I don't think we want to expand this ordinance to try to reach registered motor vehicles. I think it complicates it. Now, maybe we can do something else uh, under a different section or a new section of our town code. I'd be curious to see what uh, the chief uh, thinks of it. Um, however, I, I think maybe the idea is past this, if, if you're so inclined to address the immediate ATV issue. Obviously, somebody driving a pickup truck or, or any other vehicle on property without permission is trespassing already. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, uh, you know, I'd invite the chief if he's on to comment if he'd like. I think with the registered vehicles, we have a, a little bit more uh, ability to identify people because it's got a license plate on it. We can identify who owns it, where it comes from, makes it a little bit easier. I think, uh, uh, like Pete said, this is this is for I think more directed toward all of those vehicles that don't we don't have that ability. People that are uh, riding ATVs or, or, or dirt bikes that have no license plates. Uh, they're very hard to identify other than by color or make of the vehicle uh, and, and, and maybe something uh, separate later on with a, uh, a registered vehicle uh, because we have other, other things through the Connecticut statutes that we can charge people with 
uh, for registered vehicles that don't apply to unregistered vehicles or, or uh, vehicles that are unable to be registered. Is there any, re I mean, this ordinance spells out some specific fines. Is there any reason why I can appreciate with license plates, they're easier to identify, but once you identify them, is there any reason why these fines can't be applied to a registered vehicle? I mean, the ordinance proposed here says motorized recreational vehicle. I mean, that could be a Jeep. Right, but it's uh, it, uh, as it, as it refers to that recreational vehicle, as it, as it refers back to uh, uh, the the Connecticut statute, uh, the, it does not include the registered vehicle. Right, so it would have, would have to be either added here or, uh, as Pete said, maybe separate. Uh, so are the are the potential? I mean, once you've identified somebody in a registered vehicle on posted property, where they are trespassing, are the potential penalties equal to less than or greater than what we're proposing here for recreational vehicles? Uh, I think that the penalties here are gonna be greater on this on this ordinance. Okay. Initially, yeah. I mean, because it still it could still add trespassing and those kinds of things to somebody who's unregistered as well. I know, I just, you know, you suggested that a registered vehicle would be easier to identify, but I mean, it's almost going to push people into jeeps. Well, and, and, and to that point, we're, we're working against millions of dollars worth of advertising. Every four wheel drive vehicle commercial has them covered in mud and then going to like a gala 10 minutes later. So people think that's what's going on. Um, so that's sort of number one. Number two is. I presume that this is Kevin. I presume everything's posted already. Entrances and 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 parking lot Correct. areas are already yep, we posted. We have our signs around all the areas. It's pretty, saying, clear uh, pretty clear with um, twelve by eighteen inch signs with all our rules and regulations on it on our properties. And the similar is the same thing with the uh, land trust properties. We also have signage where no ATVs um, signs at all the you know, trail entrances. A little picture of an ATV with slash through it on top so of it. So it's pretty well. Posted a lot of our locations there. You're not supposed to be utilizing it. Um, problem is, they know, as the chiefs indicate, that the um, There's other police department, well, police department's not out there, then they can't chase. So they know they can pretty much go through and um, cameras have, that expensive. have fun there. Um, the cameras, you have the ability to get pictures, but then you have to locate where they end up on, at the end to. Um, to do enforcement of those um, ATVs there. Uh, actually, I want to just read my statement. Then we can, can, I, can, sure. I, can I hit you before one yeah. more question before you get to that? Uh, just to take the other side for a brief moment. Sure. Is there any place in any of the town property or the land trust property that is authorized for these? I mean, these folks who have these, can they say, okay, at least I got this one location where we can go kick up some mud? No. Just, pretty much in the town, any public town owned property or land trust property. These, this equipment is banned. So anybody that has one should know, is my point. Yeah, our, all, our, all our open space properties in town is um, a lot of it based on our um, grants and stuff like that. Don't allow ATVs and all those stuff of activities on our on our properties. So the motorized vehicles as defined here are Correct. all banned and everybody should know that. Correct, and then we notice all that there. Um, but yeah, there's nothing that I'm aware of that they can um, go on for, to town properties and stuff like that. The option for them is for them um, like other corporate type things around is um, getting in with a large landowner, a farmer, something like that, and utilizing, um, get permission from get permission from that person to utilize that farm or something like that large piece of property for them to utilize. But the town pieces um, or open space or um, um, fire definitions of some of the classifications don't allow for that. And also by our town ordinance doesn't allow in our open space or parks properties for these vehicles to be in as part of our um, town ordinance uh, chapter 214 parts of public places there. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Governor, you understand? Yeah, so uh, as you alluded to, uh, the Conservation Commission has their statement, which I'll read in here. Um, at the Conservation Commission February 23rd, 2022 meeting, the, con the commission voted to recommend to the Board of Selectmen that the Town of Guilford adopt an ATV ordinance. Similar to that was approved by the town of North Brantford. The commission feels that the regulation would help reduce ATV activity occurring 
and the town's open space and provides better fine system than currently in place. The Guilford Conservation um, Guilford Land Conservation Trust is in favor of the ordinance and had written a letter of support to North Brantford when they recently had a public hearing and I, they attached the copy of the regulations of North Madison, or excuse me, North Brantford and the state regulation. Um, my statement um, is I'm in favor of the ATV ordinance. There has been issues with ATVs on at the open space properties. Um, ATV activity has been observed at the Dudley Preserve, which is off of West Street in town, and with ATVs entering the property from North Brantford. Um, with problems with the James Valley and Mark Huber Preserve, with ATVs coming from adjacent properties and from the town of Durham, um, Braymore Preserve, um, where we actually had a documented pickup truck, um, which was um, caught on trail camera, uh, which left trail ruts along the whole length of a trail system through there, uh, through the mud. Um, our Timberlands and East River Preserve have had, had some ATV problems, but not as much as the northern properties. Uh, however, about a year or so ago, we had a miner operating a dirt bike at the East River Preserve, um, which was finally caught after he crashed his dirt bike on a patch of stone and required medical care. Uh, uh, as indicated by um, Spencer, one concern I have with the ordinance, it doesn't cover registered motor vehicles, such as the four-wheel drive vehicles and the registered uh, ATVs, such as um, dirt bikes. Uh, the Towns, Parks, and Places ordinance should be updated to reflect the similar fines for these vehicles. The existing ordinance provides fines of more than $50 and a maximum of $90 each for each infraction year. Um, this is probably an ordinance that's been in place probably since 70s or whatever, and it hasn't really been looked at in a while in terms of those, those fine systems there. I guess you've addressed all my questions. And I mean, the two examples you started to give were the, with the truck and the motorbike, which this doesn't address. Pete, would it be... Is it easier to just go address the, the other ordinances Kevin suggests, or can we simply add motorized recreational vehicles registered or not registered? Or, you know, what's the best way legally to attack this issue? I mean, I think it, as the um, council recommended and chief recommended, we prove what's in front of us and then look at approving the um, parks okay. and recreation ordinance since they're based off of probably two states enabling out. Yeah, it doesn't um, make sense that 50, $90 fines, these are $1,000 fines. Push everybody to trucks and motorcycles. I, I would uh, concur with that, that, you know, this came to us as a, ATV legislation being proposed. So that's what how we've reviewed it. I'd be reluctant without doing a deeper dive to see if we could extend it to res, registered motor vehicles. Those, by the way, you know, that trespass, remember too, uh, is a criminal uh, offense. So that's that's a little you know more significant than just a low fine um, that goes to court, that one. Um, yeah, but that's the point. It goes into litigation where these are spelled out. I mean, first offense, second offense, third offense. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah. I don't want to yeah, I think, I think, Pete, I think, I think that suggestion is good. I, I had one concern and uh, the uh, original intent here uh, was not original intent, but the purpose rather um, was the uh, uh, to regulate the operation of use of pocket bikes, bikes, dirt bikes, all terrain vehicles, and other similar vehicles uh, on all public property and private property within the town of Gilbert. There is a clarification under 3C on private property. Um, which uh, still allows folks who want to use ATVs on their own property are able to do so. Um, and that, uh, that that caveat is no person shall operate or cause to be operated any motorized recreational vehicle upon or within the limits of any private property within the town of Gilbert without first obtaining the written permission of the property owner or owners. Written permission shall not be required if the operator, passenger, or owner of motorized recreational vehicle is also the owner of the real property upon which uh, such vehicle is being used. So that protects personal property rights. As long as they're not filing in the noise ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bundling those together. Yeah. The tree falls in the forest. Is anybody here? <laughs> Sometimes who can hear it. Uh, any other comments uh, from the public or? Matt, Gary, Gary McElhinney yeah. here. I uh, would, uh, I would just point out that the town through its taxpayers and the land trust through its donors has invested um, substantial amounts of money in creating open space and allowing for passive enjoyment of that open space. And the, uh, these uh, vehicles 
degrade the space that we purchased and uh, hamper the enjoyment of the of the property for which uh, for which purpose it was uh, purchased. Thank you, Gary. We have someone in the room. Yeah, Frank Farrell. I'm a member of the land trust and right. on the board of advisors currently. Um, my I have a written statement. Okay. Yeah. Um, my uh, my comments are along the same lines as uh, many of the others, but I, I wanted to the way I, I read this ordinance, and I'm not familiar with the state, but uh, as far as the uh, uh, the way this ordinance is written, it, it seemed to me there there needs to be a distinction between conserved land and streets, for example, it, everything seemed to be lumped into public property, uh, uh, including the land trust and, uh, and town owned uh, conserved land, uh, along with streets and everything else where you can drive. Um, so one way of altering this would be to draw a distinction there uh, between the town properties like the East River Preserve and land trust properties. Um, because the way you, the way you read it, you could drive a pickup truck onto land trust is the way I read it uh, onto land trust property. But additionally, land trust is considered is private property used in a public manner. Uh, so that's another confusion that enters with the public. I think they tend to regard that property as public property when when really its use is governed. By the land trust, which is already mentioned. Anyway, that's I also had concerns about agricultural equipment and stuff that also needs to be regulated. I think if, if you go with the way this is uh, with this ordinance, it needs to be included. Uh, pickup trucks and jeeps and such like that, right. which we will deal with in a, I think in a separate uh, separate meeting. At this point, it seems to be the consensus right now. Uh, anyone else? No? Well, thank you for your uh, input and conversation. Uh, with that, uh, I'll close the uh, public hearing and move on to our regular agenda. Uh, item three, public forum. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, public forum. Um, anyone wishing to address about the board public forum? And uh, just uh, to, to clarify that for the record, uh, I've had conversations with both Jeff and Mark about uh, the traditional length of presentations. And mm -hmm. given the sensitive nature of this, uh, of the topic that they want to talk about, uh, I suggested that they could go on longer. We're not going to restrict it. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Hawking. I'm a lifelong resident of Guilford and a 32-year veteran of the Guilford Police Department, retiring in 2012. I'm speaking on my behalf and also the retirees listed at the bottom of the comments. The COLA language was added to the contract in 1987 pursuant to a state labor board binding arbitration award. This was not, as has been characterized over the years by many committee members and town officials, a give and take negotiated item. It was in fact the arbitration board agreeing with the union position on this issue. The union position was this, the town didn't wanna to be locked into a specific annual COLA amount. So the union proposed an every two year review where the town could adjust the COLA amount according to economic conditions. Not a yes or no matter that is, as it has morphed into since 2008. The spirit of this language is evidenced by the COLA awards for the 20 years that followed, 1988 to 2008. Only once was the same COLA percentage awarded in back-to-back -back cycles. We would ask that the town follow the arbitration award and award a COLA uh, percentage to be determined by the board based on actual or actuary recommendations. Many of the denials since 2008 were for, for what was characterized as poor economic conditions and budget uncertainty. The fact is that since 2008, the town has enjoyed budget surpluses totaling, totaling over $12 million. A recent example is in the spring of 2020 when the Board of Selectmen denied a COLA due to budget uncertainty. Two months later, the town closed the fiscal year 
with a $2.2 million surplus. Another reason for denials was that the pension fund was not funded at a high enough level to support the COLA. The fact is that the town has intentionally underfunded its actuarial recommended contributions over the years. Just one example is evidenced in the 2010 pension committee minutes during the COLA discussion in which a board member points out that the town is only funding 500,000 of a $1 million obligation. We funded our portion 100% every week from our paycheck for decades. To deny a COLA based on underfunding, which you created, is not right nor fair. At the recent 615-22 Pension Committee meeting, it was stated that COLAs appear to be not very not be very common based on the actuary spreadsheet showing only five police departments with COLAs. We have data showing 41 police agencies with COLAs supporting the argument that they are in fact very common in law enforcement. 27 of those agencies are part of the MERS system, it's a state system, which gave a 2.5% COLA for the last 10 years and just recently announced a 6% COLA for this year due to inflation. At the same 615-22 pension committee meeting during discussion of not giving us a COLA, it was suggested that if we, the police retirees, were not disabled, we could go get another job to supplement our pension. Um, that's quite a thank you for decades of risking our lives. Although the COLA review language is only in the police contract, uh, Mitch Goldblatt and Matt Hoey have said over the years that it is only fair to give it to everyone. Considering we're a high risk job, working nights, weekends, holidays, natural disasters, crime scenes, et cetera, away from our families, we do not feel it is fair to characterize us all the same. In the mid 1980s, when the first selectman's life was threatened, it was not a secretary, cafeteria worker or other town employee sent to confront the drunk, angry, shotgun toting suspect. It was us, the brave men and women of the Guilford Police Department. We also contribute the highest percentage, now 8% of our pay towards the pension. Town employees only 3% and school employees contribute nothing. From an economic standpoint, as, been, as has been many times used as a reason for denial, it does not make fiscal sense to award a COLA to 163 retirees when you were only obligated to award it to 51 retirees. It's been 14 long years since a COLA was awarded to us, and now with inflation at a 41-year high and reports that it's costing families an extra $500 a month, we ask that you please award the men and women, retired men and women of the Guilford Police Department a COLA, uh, signed by myself, um, William Cole, Robert Robinson, Sandra Brooks, Dan Leary, Donald Thompson, John Dunn, Pat Leary, Linda Bouchard, Charles Korn, William Mizano, Robert Norman, Eric Robinson, Henry Lingren, Doug Jowett, and Edward Vaughn. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, my name is Officer Mark O'Connor, and I am the president of the Guilford Police Union. I'm advocating on behalf of the current members and the retirees. Um, I think it's important, as Lieutenant Hawking said, that it, in our Article 40 of our contract is the Pension Benefit Review, review which is the same language as the 1987 um, Arbitration Award. And so this focus we believe should be on the elderly, retired officers, and the disabled officers that have served the town of Guilford. So now we have the highest inflation in over 40 years. And Millman's report was, uh, they're, they're the actuary, was 8.3% uh, approximately. Well, Wall Street Journal from last week Highest since 1981, and it's 9.1%. So when is the time to provide a cost of living adjustment to our retirees? So I think the language is important. And I'll just, it's just a few. It says, the Board of Selectmen shall have the right in its sole and exclusive discretion to make adjustments in the payments being made to former police employees previously retired under this plan. And so 
for the benefit of the record and and other people, not not the board. Um, payment is defined in Black's Law Dictionary as performance of an obligation by the delivery of money. And that examples would include an advance payment, a balloon payment, a direct payment, a down payment, a lump sum payment. So the pension committee, prior to their analysis, and they recommended against it, which we don't believe is part of the rules, had said that the uh, taxpayers don't have a pension or a COLA. Well, as Jeff Hawking said, we contributed our 8%, and it's a risky job. And I, I'll point out, and it's with great joy that I encounter this, is when the citizens of Guilford approach me as I'm getting my lunch or wherever, and they say, thank you for your service. Well, what do they mean by that? I think they're damn glad that they have a good police department who will respond. And I'll, I'll point out that some of the things that we, we do, it's, it's not just me, but it's all of them, worked every single hurricane on the street, went to the homicide down on Field Road and interviewed that poor child that found her family butchered. And we helped grab the guy. And I was at the homicide last year. And I got held over. And we get ordered. We get ordered all the time. Got ordered on Father's Day. And we got ordered on Thanksgiving. On and on and on. So certainly a taxpayer of Guilford can advise their, their children to go become a police officer. But it's a tough job. And when I got here in 2000, no one else wanted to do it. I've been glad to, to be here. So another important thing is, as uh, Lieutenant Hawking point out, pointed out, is after this arbitration award, we relied on 20 years of payments. I, I think that the language does not give the town the opportunity for zero. I mean, they, they're allowed to look at the choices based upon the recommendations of Millman. So it's our request that the Board of Selectmen for the first time in over 14 years provide a cost of living to those elderly retired officers, many of whom are disabled and many of them who are military veterans. So you see that the the, co the cost of living was increased by Social Security and by the state, but we haven't had those payments. So I would ask you to please take care of your retired officers. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else wishing to address the board in public forum? Hearing none, uh, let's move on to item four, and that's approval of minutes. Uh, 4.1 is the July 5th, 2022 regular meeting minutes. Is there a motion? I will move. Second. Second. Any comments, questions, or changes? So yeah, I do. I have a couple things if I could. Um, there are there's some notations in here. I think a little shorthand about who approved, who's you know moved and seconded that need to come out. Um, but I do have a more substantive comment on page eight, where we're discussing the um, change in the 401A plan to voluntary. And there's a statement the board was not in favor of changing the plan to voluntary. I think we need to take that out. We we didn't make a vote. And um, that, that sentence, I believe, needs to come out. I'm not sure if I agree with that sentence myself. So I suggest removing it. Yeah, and that's all I have. Just taking a look at that, that uh, paragraph. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I could support removing that. Anyone else? That's right. Yeah, good. All right. Um, anything further on this? All right. Uh, we try your minds. Uh, select woman Renner. Aye. In the room? With that adjustment. With that adjustment. With that adjustment. Aye. Yeah. Aye. 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 Yeah, that motion here. Uh, item 4.2, the July 12th special meeting minutes. Uh, is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Uh, a second. And a second. Any comments or questions? I have a, a request. Um, if you all agree that this would be appropriate. Um, this is the, 
in connection with the conversation about additional work that Mr. Gurnham did to make sure that other boards and commissions, particularly public safety, had had some involvement with the Baldwin proposal. Um, and where I'm looking is the bottom, the pages aren't numbered, but it's the bottom of the second page. Um, I actually asked, the, it's the last big paragraph on the bottom yes. of that page. Yes. Um, it says that I noted that Mr. Gurnham was busy the past week getting all that done, but what really I was asking him exactly what he did. And I would like to see a paragraph in there, which I believe can be taken from the video. Um, with, with a quote from Mr. Gurnham, just explaining the procedure that he went through since our first discussion of the proposal to make sure that the other boards and commissions and so on, that he had done the, the correct due diligence. Would it, do you agree, anyone agree or disagree? Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's no question that was the yeah. gist of what was happening there. And you noted it particularly and Cliff did touch the bases. He did, yep, he did. He explained in, in a lot of detail about all the work he had done and that satisfied us. So I'd like to see that documented. Got it. Um, put it in up just above, um, or just, just after that paragraph you just okay. mentioned? Yeah. Appropriate? Yep. Okay. Why, why don't we revise the minutes and bring them back next? Yeah. 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 That's a good idea. Right. Right. Table. Uh, is there a motion to the table? Yes. Sure. And a second. Okay. Uh, let me try your minds on table. Uh, suck one runner. Hi. Those in the room? Hi. Hi. That motion carries. Item five, finance director, Mary Jane Melovese. Receiving a report, monthly report. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Sue. Good morning. Ready? Ready. I'm going to start off um, with revenues. Uh, so this is our preliminary June 30 reports right. for the end of the year. They are unaudited um, and we will be coming back next month with more finalized versions um, as we work through. <laughs> um, you'll see that um, we are expecting, uh, we, we have brought in 101.9% of our um, budget in the revenues. And uh, these numbers are probably pretty close. I don't expect too many changes um, to these numbers um, in, in the revenue. Um, we're pretty much caught up to date, and I, and I doubt there's too much more that will be coming in. But so this is where we stand on revenues today. Excellent. Questions on the uh, revenue? No. Positive. Yeah. And it's coming in in the places that we anticipated there might be uh, you know, town clerk uh, just continuing Convain with the recording yeah. fees based Convain on what's fees, going on in the market building department uh, building in terms of uh, permitting mm -hmm. uh, tax collection uh, strong uh, but also uh, the golf uh, is the, you can see mm -hmm. um, fire was uh, was up as well youth and family services and we know the reason youth and family services is obviously a significant caseload increase that they've Okay. Um, so on, on the expenditures, um, you'll note that I did two reports, but I'm going to start with the regular report, um, which is titled Unaudited Preliminary. Um, here, of course, we still have a whole month of uh, bills um, to process. Uh, bills are still coming in that uh, for items that were um, ordered throughout June. Um, so next month, um, these numbers will change. In addition, um, what's not included here are the first two payrolls in July, which actually will be accrued back to um, last year because they um, were payments for July. So all those adjustments have not been made in these numbers um, either. Uh, I do have um, some requests for carryover funds um, in the capital, things that didn't get um, done. So those we, we typically do later on um, as well. Um, so if you if you look at this first one um, and just on the town side, it does show um, an overage of two hundred and seventy seven thousand dollars at the bottom, which is why I provided um, the second uh, spreadsheet for you, which is called adjusted for pending transfers. As you know, throughout the year, um, we have consistently talked about um, usage of some of the committed funds. Uh, that we have set aside over the years. And you'll see um, I have a column that I've added called pending transfers, which highlight um, where those numbers stand today. 
uh, we're not requesting that nice. those be done because we do have uh, more invoices that are that are coming in and we may or may not need all of the funds that are in this column. But if you were to take those transfers um, and apply it to the budget, it's showing for the town side uh, $202,000 um, surplus, which um, will be eaten up by the accruals and the payments that we, we still have have coming in. So um, and I keep referring to the town because the Board of Education has a million dollars left to spend, but they anticipate spending um, that as well. We have their balloon payments for payroll and that type of stuff. So um, I am expecting on the expenditure side um, to be closer to uh, a, a balanced budget um, okay. at, at this point. So this is like, really helpful. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like them to see the minus sign at the bottom no. of the page. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, hopefully you're all aware of all of those adjustments I've been talking about month after month yes. um, that are coming through. Yeah. Uh, are the capital uh, anticipated expenditures any particular one particular large item or just a bunch of small? Ones? No, well. um, I have a couple um, public works ones that you know that that are larger. It's mostly public works in the capital. Now uh, I know you've been working with the. Uh, uh, the fire department. Yep. That number is substantial. We had talked about it last month that uh, it, was a, it was a problem area. What, had, you know, what kind of conversations have taken place? Um, well, we have, we were able to um, close out all of their purchase orders, um, which, which helped. Um, there are two additional transfers that um, I know of. Um, we have uh, the last COVID testing and uh, the COVID um, shots and test kit giveaway um, that we did, uh, that's about $10,000. Um, and we have a receivable that we're working on, um, a military receivable so that we have someone out on military leave. Okay. Um, and so we'll be getting money back. Uh, we anticipated uh, that to be, I believe, somewhere around. 70,000 or, or it's a substantial amount of money, I believe, um, but I don't have those numbers yet, but that's, that's all um, I have. So keep in mind, I have two weeks of payroll to apply to that. Um, as I, as I alluded to um, uh, earlier, <laughs> uh, so that, that number is, is apt to go up rather than down. Um, I, 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 for the past two months been, um, you know, talking with um, the chief and the deputy chief, um, as I reported last week, um, we do have a couple of people out, um, like the military and another person uh, on a medical leave. Because of that, we have almost $300,000 of replacement costs for just those two people. Um, that makes up a significant amount of that overage. Um, I'm sure the fire chief, as he has in the past, be more than willing to attend, um, specifically at least the board of finance meeting next month. Um, but uh, as far as I know, we've, we've done all, all that I am aware of. Um, and the replacement salaries are for uh, traditional replacement, uh, as you've described, uh, and not because of additional duties for our work associated with COVID. Part no, we are we are covering. Um, yeah, we are, we are getting those costs back. Um, we're working with FEMA right now um, on the, uh, the the COVID um, booster shot. Uh, you know the boosters. So that that money I've already have in as receivables. Um, even though we haven't gotten the money from FEMA, um, we've already taken those numbers out of this. Um, and Mitch, um, they're down some employees. Fire department? Five. Down five at this point? Well, they're down, they're down five. They've hired, though, four uh, part time firefighters to fill some of that gap that they're working with. And possibly, uh, depending on circumstances, some or all those four may become full time. But for right now, they're part time. Well, it's just it, it, it's concerning the replacement salaries now. Um, better than one third of the regular full time salary line item, um, which suggests that the staffing model is not working 
uh, but it's not working largely because we have vacancies at this point. I think the chief or, uh, or uh, assistant chief should probably address that more. They watch those numbers very closely. Well, I'm sure this will uh, come to the attention of certain board of finance members at tonight's meeting. So you might want to uh, talk to Charlie and Mike about having some representation for tonight's meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else on expenses? No. All right, medical? Uh, fund. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been talking about when is the effect of, of COVID going to hit the medical fund? And, mm -hmm. and, and we have the past couple of months, um, the, the, at least the last two months of the year. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the bottom line, we are projecting a deficit of $550,000 um, in this fund, um, which uh, it will be absorbed from surpluses, la you know, during the, during the two COVID years where we um, had lapsed. So that, that's where we stand right now as far as the underlying um, fund. Uh, the catastrophic claims were at 45% um, at, at this point with 25 people over the $75,000 $75, limit and seven of them over the $150,000 limit. And, and the clock started? Clock right? restarted July 1. We started mm -hmm. July 1, so we'll go back to first dollar, right? Correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, are there any other, uh, are there any lagging claims that might come in against that? In other words, will we receive some benefit from that policy in the next 30 or 60 days? For the catastrophic claims? Yes. No. No, it's, it's a hard June 30 cutoff. Whatever they have in. So we uh, obviously, by definition, insurance is a risk, mm -hmm. and in this case, paid a considerably higher premium than we got back in benefits. Maybe that'll be reflective in what the next premium is. Maybe. Um, that that's prob probably probably not. <laughs> you know, we, we do. Uh, it is based on you know rolling claims. Um, so mm -hmm. we we are working very hard on catastrophic. Claims with, without committing. Understood, for sure. No, but, but keep in mind that for many years we we benefited right. immensely mm -hmm. from from this. It's a necessary. So it's avoiding bad up and downside is the way. Correct. It's okay. That's the nature of insurance. Uh, ah, yeah, guy. It's safe for a lot of years. You don't need it. You get hedging against catastrophic loss. Okay. Okay. But thanks. No, oh, I did have one other claim. Okay. That question on, on claim the admin piece. Why would we be seventy nine thousand dollars in the hole in the admin? I would think that's like a fixed number. It, it's not. It's it's a percentage. Okay. Um. So as our, you know, as the claims go up and down, certain items are are, are more or less. So. Interesting. Some items are fixed, but not yeah. all. Okay. Well, that explains that. I know I noticed that the slim nation is included in here. It's a very small amount, but I was wondering if you happen to know about the participation. Oh, thank you for great, great segue. <laughs> Wonderful segue, right? Nation? You're welcome. <laughs> so I have a report on slim nation because I thought um, the board of selectmen and the board of finance might be interested um, to know how that is working out. So um, so the town had 22 employees apply. Um, and 20 were chosen by lottery. The Board of Ed had 20, uh, it also has 20 people in, um, in the system at, at this point. Uh, we had one person drop out, um, but was replaced by somebody on the waiting list. So we are, we are full with our 40 people in the Slim Nation. So I have a couple of quotes um, from people that have sent Mitch some, some notes. He's gone to Mitch. Um, so from the, uh, some, a member of the Board of Ed um, writes, I wanted to reach out to you personally and thank you for bringing Rob Nevin Slim Nation's program to Guilford. I can't begin to tell you what a difference it has made in my eating habits and have, it has only been three weeks. I was a true junk food junkie. This is the first time I have ever gone this long without eating processed food and candy. I feel so much better without having the highs and lows of the sugar rush. I appreciate the time you put in to make this happen for us. Thank you again for changing my way of life. Oh, wow. And a member of the town, I have been following the Rob Nevins plan for two weeks now. I can tell you it's working for me. 
My case is very different than most, but it's working. Thank you for doing all that hard work to put this together for all of us. So it's a thank you. These went to Mitch because of Mitch's push to put this through. We had a third one come through from the Board of Ed just on Friday afternoon. These are unsolicited. Yeah, these, right. you know, yes. these were coming in, which led me to, to, to send you. But I just wanted to give you um, an idea. Um, I know just talking to people, even in this building, you know, that, that are, are working, it, it's, it, I believe it's really working for a lot of people and we're only a, a month or so in. Um, so. Yeah, and, and anecdotally, we were in this very room last week yeah. celebrating somebody's <laughs> birthday, and there were a couple of folks in this building who did not partake in the wonderful cake mm -hmm. because they're on the plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, so it was a lot of discussion about the plan. Yeah, we should have had all the birthdays in April, and then we went, okay, <laughs> But I just wanted to share that with you, and I will share that with the Board of Finance this evening. Um, so, you know, Hopefully the success of this program might you, you might be willing to, you know, do it again after this one. This one is complete. So thank you. Okay. Anything else from Mary Jane? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Item six, economic development director, Sherry Cody. Good morning, Sherry. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I can hear yes. you quite well. Great. Thank you. Tracy, can I share my screen? I'm not with you in person because I do like to do a little show and tell with a PowerPoint, <laughs> even though I'm right next door. <laughs> think I'm good to share. Perfect. All right. And can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I will start with uh, one of my favorites, and that is our property enhancement grants. Um, so we did have one project that was approved at our July Economic Development Commission meeting. Um, so our total project costs, uh, sorry, for this application, $25,000, and I'll show you the, uh, the application in just a moment. Um, but so for uh, year to date, our total project costs are $86,000 from all of our uh, participants. This would be our 12th um, application that was approved. And so we've invested $11,478. The reason that's not $12,000 is because a few people asked for a less than the $1,000 um, limit. Uh, and so our businesses are investing a total of $74,730. Um, so again, I'll, I'll repeat what I say every time. And I think that this is a good return on our investment. Um, so this is the application that was approved this month, uh, a, the construction of a pergola and landscaping at South Lane Bistro. Oh. <clears throat> and so they're spending $25,000 and we're giving them $1,000 towards their project. Mm -hmm. um, so we have had some uh, ribbon cuttings and milestone celebrations also over the last month or so. Uh, in Bloom Floral Warehouse uh, out on the uh, west uh, end of Boston Post Road is a new business celebrating uh, that with the Chamber of Commerce. Amanda's Healthy Cooking here uh, by the Green, that's uh, in the location that used to be Vietnam's Cafe. Avenge Fitness Clothing, uh, that one uh, was celebrated just with the town um, and that is located where Shift Cycle used to be. They had a pretty big uh, um, party in their parking lot. Uh, they are going to be using the first floor of Shift Cycle where that where that used to be. And then on the second floor, they will be renting to uh, a children's dance group. Uh, so they were there and performed as well. I don't have photos yet because they had a professional photographer there um, and I just haven't received the, the photos uh, from that yet. Uh, milestones, this is something that the Shoreline Chamber has really taken uh, an interest in recently um, of celebrating our, mild, our business's milestones. So you can see Bishops has been in business for 150 years, so they had a little celebration. Uh, we celebrated with Guilford Texaco, celebrating 50 years in business. Breakwater Books, 50 years. Mm -hmm. Of course, new ownership over the last couple of years. And then the Shoreline Chamber also held their own celebration, celebrating 10 years since the merger between Guilford and Branford Chambers. Uh, in developments, um, we have uh, a couple of new ones, Strawberry Hill Preserve, 
um, at 2222 Boston Post Road. Um, that application has been received by PNZ, but no action has been taken on that yet. Um, Bishop's Orchards is uh, asking for a zone change for a portion of their land. Um, and then I, I think I mentioned to you previously 397 Church Street with the medical office building that is working its way through the process. Uh, I believe they are uh, concluded with design review committee, um, have had their first uh, public hearing with PNZ and will have another one as well. Um, and then Hubbard Road, of course, has been approved. Um, but to segue into uh, um, uh, this, so the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce uh, every year holds a regional real estate and construction forecast. Um, and they have invited uh, their municipal partners to present a project uh, to be held or to be shown showcased at their event. Um, and so we did put together a little, uh, um, it's, a, it's a poster board um, for the Hubbard Road project, um, our first uh, affordable housing project. Um, so that was displayed at the event um, for the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. So that's good, just a lot of eyeballs, you know, uh, seeing some of the work that we're doing here in town. Um, Tourism, uh, so this is a great initiative um, that I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, and you may recall during um, the ARPA uh, communications or planning, uh, when we knew we were receiving ARPA funds, we put together a list of projects. And right at the top of that list was tourism and promoting tourism in the town. Um, you know, so we, we talked about doing a tourism website, creating a tourism website, and the Guilford Preservation Alliance popped up and said, but we already have a tourism website. Um, so what can we do to partner? And so um, we've taken that to the next step and we have signed uh, a memorandum of understanding with GPA um, that the town and GPA will share the responsibility of a tourism website. Um, this is really important to us because Previously, GPA um, would allow businesses to be on their website only if they paid a fee to be on their website. And that's something they needed to do so that they could, you know, pay their, their costs. Um, because we're a municipality, I think it's important that we promote all of our tourism businesses, not, you know, uh, limited to those who can afford to be on the website. Um, so they agree with that, uh, and we are moving forward. We have uh, issued an RFP uh, for a web developer to redesign this website. This website, um, I don't, I'm not sure if you've ever taken an opportunity to look at it, was designed for the kiosk, the electronic billboard kiosk that is over by the information booth by the community center, um, was not at all designed for online use. It was really designed for the kiosk. So it's not optimized for um, people to be looking at it from outside of Guilford. Um, so we have issued the RFP and received five proposals. Um, so right now we're in sort of that evaluation phase of looking at the proposals to see how we wanna move forward um, with a, a set budget. Uh, GPA is donating funds to this as well as uh, the town using some of our ARPA funds. Um, so I'm pretty excited that, you know, uh, during the fall sometime we will hopefully have a new website and be able to promote that and, and get people to come to town more people to come to town and spend their money. Um, so also sort of in the realm of, uh, of, of tourism a little bit, um, you know, I've been talking to you a lot about our welcome signs and they've been, you know, uh, talked about a lot from uh, people in town, people coming to town, but we're also hearing from other towns who might be seeing a little green, um, a little jealousy because we have these beautiful signs. I'm bringing this up again today only to let you know that, um, uh, sort of phase two is starting, uh, and that is uh, two things. One, we are installing solar lights uh, at these welcome signs, the exit signs, so that they will be lit up at night because currently there's there's no lighting. Uh, so that's a little fuzzy picture, terribly uh, fuzzy because it came off of the internet of what the solar little lamp will look like. Um, and then the, the, the next part of this phase is our internal wayfinding signs. So I'll show you some images of uh, what the committee has come up with for some wayfinding signs. Um, unfortunately, I learned just a few minutes ago that uh, the DOT is going to require us to do um, 
standalone posts for our signs. So where you see them combined with other signs, that will not be allowed. Uh, we have to go back to the drawing board and um, put them on their own posts, um, which may not be a bad thing because some of the posts that exist now are a little bit twisted and bent. Um, but this at least gives you a visual of what uh, they will look like when they are completed. Um, uh, they've been designed, the locations have been chosen, uh, they've been run by our town engineer um, who has agreed with uh, the location and, and uh, you know, they're not in any kind of danger of um, being in the way. Um, and so this will be really great once it's concluded, but as I mentioned, we do have to uh, sort of evaluate the post situation um, because of the email that we just received a few minutes ago. Um, so that's that's it. <laughs> any questions? Thank you, Sherry. Anybody have any questions? Positive. No. Thank, thank you, Sherry. Uh, I think this is, uh, we're going to continue this, uh, this, this uh, routine of having you report out once a month. Uh, it's, it's, good to, it's good to get the uh, clued in as to what's taking place. So thank you very much. Do we okay. have any discussions going on about uh, retail vacancies? Yeah, Sherry. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, any in the particular? Middle, the, the rumor mill is rife and uh, actually it's beyond rumor mill at this point it's been confirmed that uh, uh, the old walmart spot will have a new tenant yes uh, so i wasn't really able to hear the question clearly but i think it's what's happening um that but Okay, so we'll start with Walmart. Uh, yes, it has been widely reported in every uh, newspaper, I think, and on social media at nauseum a little bit that um, uh, TJ Maxx and Home Goods is looking at the Walmart spot. And so the building owner, property owner, is in negotiations with uh, TJ Maxx and Home Goods. Um, if that comes to fruition, they will take up uh, almost three quarters of the space, not the entire space that exists. So the, the two stores would be on the smaller side, um, but that would leave a third uh, opportunity for another spot or another uh, business. That business um, would be located on the very end of the Walmart space with the door facing the side of the building, not the front. So it's a little bit um, wonky. Uh, it would you know, be a little bit different, but in my opinion, I think if it's a destination spot, um, like a gym or a medical facility, people would park on that side of the building and enter mm -hmm. the building. I don't think it necessarily has to have a, 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 you know, a door in the front. Um, that has been written in the newspaper already too. So I feel comfortable saying that again. Um, so yeah, that's in negotiations. Um, there is a rumor. Uh, I had hoped that Target would come, um, but that's not happening. Uh, there is a rumor that Target may be uh, going into the Brantford movie theater, uh, which would be kind of exciting to have them nearby. Um, that's also been uh, published a lot on social media. Um, and so it is, that's about it. Um, we all know that Prime, uh, Prime on Whitfield is coming to the old Centro place, Centro Pizza. Um, I think they're having some delivery concerns uh, with delays in equipment, um, you know, special equipment they need for their kitchen. So that's delaying their opening. Um, but other than that, you know, uh, minor movements around town, um, but I don't think anything that I can really talk about publicly um, that's that's in my head at the moment. Okay. I don't know if, uh, if it's Sherry's, you know, Wheelhouse. Yeah, wheelhouse is uh, you know, any of the, the residential projects that the big ones have were in the works? Any updates? Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Any of the updates uh, like on uh, State Street? And, uh, you know, you did mention the uh, Boston Post <laughs> going out on the West End 2020, whatever it was, 2030. Uh Yep, yep. So um, I think what I'll do, if, that, if that's okay, I wrote a report recently for Mary Jane for our um, her bonding uh, um, consultants yeah. um, that actually gives an update on all of the projects in town. So I'll, I'll send that out to the board. Um, I don't have it memorized in my head at the moment. I wrote it a few weeks ago, but I will send that out and that will give you kind of an update on where some of those residential projects stand in terms of their um, uh, completion. Right. Yeah, I, I thank you very much for having put that document together. We, Mary Jane and I did use that in our ratings calls last week with uh, uh, Standard and Poor's and Fitch. 
Uh, and I think it, it, it covered almost all of the projects, uh, the, the, the residential projects, starting with 66 High Street, um, 405 Whitfield, which is Eagles View, uh, State Street One, Hubbard Road, um, uh, the Muse, which is also on Route One. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll distribute that. There's, there, at, at, at present, there looks to be close to 300 units of housing that are on the drawing board at this point. Um, um, Particularly if you take uh, take into account the location across the street from the uh, rock pile, the old rock pile, um, the residential a, one. That's a hundred. Yeah, that's a hundred units going in, in in back there. Wasn't there a commercial project? The front part of it is commercial. Uh, the, the first parcel and that you know where where they're yeah. stockpiling all the uh, materials Stock. that they're that they're uh, extracting. Um, I've actually had a chance to go back in there. The topography of it has changed quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See if you're yeah. highway. Yeah. All right. Sure. Any timing on any? I, I know we have a lot in the works and a lot of, you know, gossip turning on it all. But are there any? Uh, I know Eagles Nets probably is that's moving along. But we get ready for foundations yeah. over there. I go right by that a couple times a day. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, are we looking next summer or following? Or? Uh, they're planning on being done in. Uh, this winter, uh, the first two phases they're going to do. How about any of the other big ones? The other big ones probably wouldn't break Still around. working through permitting. Yeah, yeah through, through permitting process. Uh, okay. It'll be interesting to see what happens at Hubbard Estates, how quickly they get moving. Uh, they've been pretty aggressive in trying to push it. Uh, it's through P and Z, isn't it? It's through P. It's, it was approved, fully approved. So, um, great job, Sherry. Appreciate it. Thank you. You got it. Okay, um, item seven, uh, director. Oh, go ahead. Um, sure, I'm sorry. The coordination with our uh, Madison. Yes. Yes, That's yes cool. absolutely. Um, so uh, um, we did pull a meeting together uh, with the two town planners, two town gen engineers, the two first select people, and myself uh, to talk about IIJA. That's the infrastructure. Um, bill that the federal government is, is producing to see uh, if there are projects that the two towns can be working on. I brought this up again with uh, First Select Man, Woman Lyons uh, on Friday, just to kind of keep that in the back of her head in terms of what, what we could be working on. It's really more of a town planner, town engineer question um, because they are responsible for those kinds of projects. I'm really just a convener in terms of making sure that we're trying to work together. But one of the things that came up um, in our initial uh, conversation was Route 1, the Route 1 corridor, and, and making sure that the two towns are sort of, um, uh, that we're working together to make Route 1 be uh, sort of a, uh, I guess, coordinated effort uh, for whatever we do on Route 1. There was also some discussion between the two first, uh, first the two town engineers uh, about the bridge uh, that uh, is on the east end of Guilford where uh, Madison and, and Guilford connect and um, and doing something with that. I'm not sure exactly what it is that they that they need to do to that bridge, um, but the town engineers certainly knew uh, what what they needed to do and they were talking about that. So so we continue to have those conversations and um, and I'll do what I can to you know make sure that the parties convene and and we, talk about how we can work together. There's a lot of money at stake, I think, but Matt will probably tell you that um, COG, uh, SCROG is mostly going to be involved in that, that, I think, and they certainly play on a regional level. I don't know if you're allowed to talk about it or not because it's in Madison, but is there any word on that uh, project right by the bridge over the um, there? Um, so I know that there, I'm trying to uh, pick my words carefully of what I can say. Uh, there was a project um, approved years ago, I'm not sure how many, uh, for a uh, few slips and a restaurant of some kind, a small restaurant. To my knowledge, that project is no longer, uh, the, the property owner is no longer interested in doing that project. Um, and, um, and that's as much as I can say, I think, publicly. Okay. Good. Good. Awesome. Sherry, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. All right. Uh, item seven, Director of uh, Human Resources, Mitch. 
7.1 is to consider an act on a recommendation from the pension committee regarding the cost of living adjustment COLA for current pensioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the reason I am here, and this has already been mentioned somewhat in the uh, public uh, participation portion of this meeting, the board of selectmen, after receiving the report referred to in the preceding paragraph, which let me go back a second. Retirement board shall cause a study be made by the plan actuary and prepare a report to the first selectman for submission to the board of selectmen every two years, commencing with the first fiscal year and in June 30th, 1986, on the current status of the pension benefits made to all retirees who were previously police off employees and the effect of economic conditions on the payment over that period. The board of selectmen, after receiving the report referred to the preceding paragraph, shall have the right in its sole and exclusive discretion to make adjustment in the payments being made to former police employees previously retired under this plan. This is in the police uh, collective bargaining agreement, um, as was mentioned before. The uh, Our actuary, Milliman, did put together a report, and the um, uh, pension committee did review it and has made a recommend, recommendation not to uh, adjust for a cost of living at this time. I have provided to you, you should have a board pack, copies of the pension committee minutes, the draft minutes uh, of that meeting of June 15th, as well as the report from Milliman that were provided that um, for that meeting that was uh, dated June 9th. Uh, in addition, there were the uh, cost of living adjustments compared statistics that were also provided by Milliman uh, for your perusal. So um, at this point it is, in your hands. <clears throat> All right, questions? So, so anybody? Tell, tell me what Milliman's charge was exactly. They, they, their description has been provided, a limited review of the data used for reasonableness. But tell me, tell me exactly what their charge was. So their charge is to determine what the uh, consumer price index, AKA cost of living adjustment, um would be for the for the the years that are being uh, uh considered at this time mm. and so what they put together is that if an employee had retired before january 1st 2020 the full cost the cpi as they call it uh consumer price index uh would be eight and a half percent i see that and i'm not sure why but um, Milliman has consistently over the many, many years shown a full CPI as well as a 60% of CPI um, as well. <clears throat> That's just some straight math there, really. Yeah. And then they've also provided for you what the impact would be on each of the uh, pension plans over the next, I believe, eight, uh, 20 years, 18 to 20 years that this would be amortized over for this particular um, cost of living adjustment if it were so um, approved. That, that's the change just for this one year, if this one year was approved either at 100 or 60%. Correct. Okay. All right. And the uh, spreadsheet you provided, uh, that they provided, uh, breaks it out. Various, all three of the uh, pension yeah, plans. Yeah, each of the three pension plans were looked at separately. Uh, we usually do that anyway. Uh, in this case, as this has already been reported, and as I'm sure you're aware, the only requirement for the Board of Selectmen is to review the police pension plan. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, when there have been adjustments made or adjustments not made, uh, it's affected all three plans. So the question before us is, uh, is police department specifically, uh, do you have any comments or, or questions? I, I just want to make sure I'm reading the numbers correctly. Um, sure. Can can you just point us to the, the highlights here? Uh, for the numbers, well, if you look at the attachment that was put together from the cost of living, retiree cost of living adjustment letter yeah. put out by Jen Castellano from Milliman, Mm -hmm. There are th there are three attachments. Um, since we've discussed mostly the police, I'll look at the police plan for right now. Mm -hmm. um, the actuary determined contribution, which this board has approved, um, 
for for the police plan uh, for 2023 with eight hundred seventy six thousand seven hundred eighty one dollars. The impact um, would be, and you can see in that if you look at proposed change number one, the impact going forward starting next next fiscal year when this would be impacted will not impact this budget. Mm -hmm. Impact the following budget. Um, would begin at $168,000 for fiscal year ending 2024, $184,000 for 2025, $185,000 for 2026, and so on. Do you see that, Sue? I, I do see that. That's the middle exhibit. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And that is, for, I'm sorry, I know you guys are all ahead of me on this. That's for all employees, not just police. No, that's police. Look that's at the police. Very, very top of that page, it says Town of Guilford. Oh, yes. Police Thank you. Department. Okay. All right. And there's there's two other sheets that are very similar that would show the impacts for if you were to approve for all three or one, two, or three, uh, the employees' pension plan first year is eighty six thousand dollars, and for the the school employees would be first year forty five thousand dollars. Okay. Not certified school employees. Not certified, right? This okay. is not teachers. They're in their own uh, reti teacher retirement plan through the state of Connecticut. <clears throat> okay. Does that help explain? Yeah, that? yeah, thank you. Okay. 168. And so if you look at the very bottom of those columns, mm -hmm. it'll show you the total cost over 20 years for each of the three plans. You see that? Yes, I do see that. All right. For just just I'm so sorry. Just forgive me. There's three, there's three exhibits. What is the first one? The other two are labeled police and, and non-certified school. But what is the first one? Employees. That's that's your town employees. Okay. So none of nothing the, here is the total. They're all they're all just, no, yeah, the to total all to, the total altogether would be approximately four point five point three million dollars okay. over the twenty years. That's why the uh the pension committee minutes say it's between one million and, and five million. I was trying to that right. was calculating all that's calculating all of them. Yes. Okay. So the one million essentially is the police only at sixty percent. So your your employee your employees plan Sue would include people in the Guilford Employee Association, Guilford Supervisors Association, your dispatchers, and your firefighters. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So adding the three of these together gives that five and, million dollar number. And, and, and also your your uh, non non uh, represented people as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. I apologize. Don't apologize. Just make sure I got it. Board of members one to five. That's not annual. No, no that's total. Over, over 20 years. Yeah. But but for but for a COLA that happens just this year, if you did COLA every year, then those numbers would be, you know, continue. Well, the, the COLA gets yeah. the baseline once. Yeah. You know. Okay, but your your one year impact, Charles, on fiscal year 2024 for all three. Is about three hundred thousand dollars. One hundred sixty-eight thousand for I do this in my head. One hundred sixty-eight thousand for the police, eighty-six thousand for the employees, forty-five thousand for the non-certified board of that. Mm -hmm. That's the one year your first that'd be your first year impact of granting the cost of living adjustment. Okay. Um, as was mentioned earlier in public forum. Uh, we have had discussions here and have advocated uh, talk about the fact that the police aren't the only union uh, that is facing uh, the pressures of inflation and uh, the time value of money based on their retirement date. So one, one of the things I did was I took a look at the differential between the three plans in terms of what the impact would be if we were to approve this at the those either of those two proposed changes they did at the full CPI or a modified uh, or reduced CPI. And it's it's interesting um, for the police retirement fund, the proposed change number one basically results in an increased contribution on an annualized basis of about 20%. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, under option two, it's a little over 12%. Uh, if you go to the uh, town and the GEA pension plan, uh, those same adjustments are 8.2% and 4.8%. And then lastly, if you do the uh, school's uh, non-certified pension plan, the 
proposed changes um, to the two CPI index numbers is 4.9 and 2.99%. Why such a dramatic difference in the impact? Um, well, I, I think I think it's fair to say that the the police pension plan, as it's been established, is a much more expensive plan because that group, unlike the other two groups, can collect not at age 65, but actually the time of her retirement. So retirement, retirement, normal retirement age is 20 years. Many will stay till 25 years because it'll allow them to get uh, retiree medical benefits for both themselves and a spouse. But even so, you're looking at people collecting 15 to 20 years earlier than the people in the other plans. Therefore, that, that's why that cost is so much more. Also, the police plan is the only plan that allows any uh, implementation of any, any and it's, it's limited, over, and it's limited appropriately uh, over time into their base pay as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a more expensive plan. There's no doubt about it. I think they recognize it, which is one reason why they are paying 8% of the plan. They recognize that. Uh, they have a 2.25% multiplier for the people retiring now, uh, which is higher than the than, than the, most of the people on the employee's pension plan. There's varying, depending on which, which um, bargaining unit um, or group people are in, that varies as well. But in all cases, the other plans are pretty much, unless it's a disability, which is an exception to all the plans, mm -hmm. um, it would be age 65 would be your, your normal retirement age. Mitch, I... And I'm sorry, the, the fire department does have a modified uh, retirement age, which is sooner, but it's not as um, uh, quick, if you will, as the, uh, as the police plan, which has been this way for a long time. I'm sorry. Without, uh, uh, I don't know if you have this information available, and without associating any names to the numbers, I'm sort of curious what the range of um, annual pension benefits are for the police that are retired and are receiving these benefits. I mean, we're talking. The, the range can be low, depending on how long ago someone retired. Remember, the, the benefits I just pronounced, the 2.25% multiplier, the 20 years and out probability, mm -hmm. the, the salaries that police officers are making. Now, remember, this is based on, on salaries as well. People retired 20 years ago didn't have a lot of the, that benefit. They were making a lot less money, mm -hmm. uh, as is expected. Uh, they weren't able to retire as soon as it's been negotiated in more recent contracts. They don't have a 2.25% multiplier. The, the additional money for overtime might not have been there when they retired. I'm not sure when that exactly kicked yeah. in. So th there are probably, I don't have it off. I do have it back on my desk. I could find it in my computer what, what the people are making, but it could be a lower amount. I don't know how low is low, but I can tell you that based on the actuarial report that we have from uh, uh, July 1, 2021, that the average annual benefit is about $34,000. Okay. That's the, the average. average. So it's average is always a tricky number. Yeah. So it's going to go from much lower to much higher. Right. And so, but in addition to that, I'd be also curious what percentage of retirees from the police department are receiving benefits and, and have not yet reached the age of 65? Quite a few. Quite, uh, anybody who's retired in the last 15 years has pretty much, not every one of them, or uh, most of them have retired. And usually I say in their 50s. I don't know if Jeff has better statistics than I do on this, but um, I could check, but most are, you know, um, and, and in addition to that, hold on, Lee, Lee, I think, I think I might be able to give you an answer. So of the service retirees right now, that means people who are receiving pension now, there is one person under 50 that was, uh, uh, based on when they were able to retire. There are 19 people between ages 50 and 59. There are 13 between ages 60 and 69. There are four between 70 and 79. There are three between 80 and 89. There's nobody over 89. So wait, let me understand that. There's seven people over the age of 69? There are seven people over the age of 69. Perfect. That's not just police. That's no, this is just police. police. This is the police. That is just, yeah, just oh. police. And uh, in addition, the, 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 the police, uh, sorry, as opposed to the certified teachers who are not part of Social Security, their retirement is a completely different program. Police officers paid into Social Security as well. 
Yes. Okay. As do we. Mary Jane, you had your hand up. I just wanted to say I, I have the uh, monthly benefit report in front of me. Um, each month, it's a each month it's approximately one hundred and fifty-five thousand um, dollars in benefits for fifty-five people, averaging twenty-eight hundred dollars per benefit. Mm -hmm. Averaging again. Average. That's that the average. average. The, the spreadsheet would tell maybe a slightly different. Story. What, what Mary Jane, we have in front of you is probably you have the check register. Yes. So is it possible for you to look at one of the lower amounts that Lou is looking for? Yeah, well, it's on this page, I see one at 582 and another at 4,624. So there is a big gap there. I find another one at 6,190. Trying to see if I find anything lower than the 500. Uh, looks like the lowest I have is 490. When Mary Jane says benefits, she's talking pension, not pension only. And not the health benefits in addition. You're, you're going to need the check rates just for the pension benefit, correct? Pension right. benefits, yes. Okay. Uh, is, is Do we have the discretion to do targeting? Because I think I heard uh, Officer O'Connor uh, emphasize addressing the elderly and yeah. the disabled. Uh, if I was if I wasn't mistaken, I thought he focused on the on those we two. mentioned it. Yeah, <laughs> one two. of the if I can point out one of the Milliman exhibits seems to indicate that some towns do that. Yeah, if I'm reading it correctly. I also want to understand while we're while we're carrying through the language of the contract and our options, um, Mr. Hockey made an argument with regard to what happened at uh, Pizza Lawn, but. I hate to always do that before a lawyer. Um, uh, what happened at that some arbitration 20 years ago and what the outcome is? I mean, you know, breaking down that exact language would be sort of instructive. Making sure we understand. That. I mean, there was an implication in the statement that this is not discretionary as to whether to pay the benefit or not, but only the amount of the benefit. And I'd be really interested to make sure all this time we were on solid ground. Uh, to answer that from my standpoint, for the last six or seven times that you looked at this, as you know, and it's been well documented, there's not been a COLA that has been granted. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that this information has been brought to my attention. Okay. I have not heard about this before. I've just been going by the language, and you have too, the language in the police contract and the language in the pension plan. The pension plan, the police retirement fund was never amended. To say anything with language such as that that says that there has to be a cola, the you know we can we can mince words here about what it means by sole and exclusive discretion, and then as Mark O'Connor pointed out, to make adjustment. So, does that mean you have discretion to make an adjustment? Or does that mean you have discretion not to make an adjustment? I'm not an attorney, so I don't know. Back to what Sue said, um, uh, I'm looking at the comparative statistics that you referred to. And are you referring to just there's a couple of, I guess it's just North North Haven, is that that just says the cola does not start until year following sixty second birthday. Is that what you're referring yeah. to? Yeah. Well, yes, but I think in a in a larger sense, some of the others have other um, kind of sort of separating criteria, date of retirement. A couple of them have. Um, Several so, of them have date of retirement. So, so okay. I, I don't know how that affects us, but I guess I'm just saying there's, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Obviously, it doesn't have to be 100% of CPI or 60%. It could be well, any amount. Um, but it seems like there are a lot of different ways of looking at it, possibly when, breaking it down. When this report says COLA, yes or no, does that mean this year or in the contract period? I'm sorry, what are you referring to, Charles? This, in this okay. report, the same report, okay. it says COLA, yes or no. Oh, That's whether it. that town provides a COLA. So if, no. okay. if it says no, that town does not provide a COLA. Which attachment are you looking at, Charles? Comparative statistics. This one? The question is. Oh, okay. This was, this was provided by Milner looking at okay. cool. some comparative Connecticut towns. It does not have the, the, the same breadth of uh, numbers that were referred to in the public session. They're looking at similar towns, um, and um, a lot of a lot of 
some, I don't know about a lot, some towns are in the MERS system, which does provide a coal, I believe. The, the question I'm trying to ask is when it says yes or no, is that did they make a COLA determination this year, or is that just in, like we would fall into in this comparison, we would be yes because we have the option. correct. We would fall into yes that the COLA. Okay. Is so that's allowed. so this is yeah. not yes or no. They did the reason I bring that up in the minutes. One of the pension committee members made the point about this would not be the year for COLA anyway because of the, you know how the pension is flowing. So. That's what I'm trying to figure out. My, my understanding is the ones that say no, do not have, have the option. Don't even have anything in okay. any kind of right. language that even. So we have two. Uh, you know, this is even another discussion. You know, not philosophical question of whether it's Grand Cola. It's a matter of this particular year. Also, that's the two points that I gleaned yeah. from the minutes are, you know, the overall cost long term and the consequences, and also is this the year to do it. Yes, so the, the hit the pension is, is making the market. Well, you obviously have you obviously have the discretion to be able to grant the call because that has been done in the past and that is you know part of the contract. The question is, as you say, whether you feel it's appropriate this year. And you have, like I say, you have the pension committee's input. Uh, you have Milliman's input, which you know is you know the, the, the only input is really factual, except as I pointed out, and they point out. There will be a impact on your um, your contributions going forward, and the one year's cola will have impact over the next twenty. And if you do it two years from now again, it's gonna it's gonna escalate. You know, it's gonna come out. But that's that's your decision. That's your discretion and how you want to build your budget. Or well, this chart that that this comparative statistics is interesting. I mean, the towns are. Towns that do pay are all over the place. And Madison, just for, not that we compare ourselves to Madison ever, <laughs> but um, you know, they're, they're, if I'm reading this correctly, they, they just have a locked in one percent. That's my understanding. It's a lock. It's yeah, a lock in. I, so it's not automatic. A lot, a lot, so a lot, a lot of colas are that they just locked in. They negotiate, some number. They negotiated a one percent, a two percent increase. For all time, and there's no discretion on the board. So that's either. a little bit where that arbitration was going. I, you know, again. Not being an attorney and not you know reading it and everything, but when he said that that was a decision in arbitration, that means there had been a discussion and they were simply picking sides in that discussion, not whether or not there was one. Just that's what I'm looking at, but I don't know. I don't see it. Talking about Bergen's institutional knowledge there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to because it would be hearsay. Oh, I was a part of that oh, okay. negotiation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, my presumption is this thing's been well gone over in our position. Well, yeah, we yeah, that, that's the third this part of this this discussion is you know we have a pension committee to to do this kind of and I'm analysis. sure they poured over the same question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I I would have to see some. I'd have to have more information to override the pension committee. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I was looking at the comparative statistics, um, I was reading that column, yes, no column, as to whether or not it was um, automatic. Because all the ones that say yes, it's an annual. Right. So I think yeah. let's, let, let, okay. you know, let's, let's clarify that question with Milman, right? Um, so, in other words, some of the no's might be like ours, where it's discretionary. Exactly. Not, not Yeah. Right, gotcha. And these are all for uh, um, North Island. Yeah, the yes, no is very vague there. What does oh, yes, no mean? Yeah. And you know, just because other towns are doing it does not necessarily mean, you know, that's our reason for doing it because mm -hmm. we all learned that the 401 and the rest of it, that, you know, not all towns make perfect decisions. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, so, so we go through this process every couple of years because the police contract mentions it. None of the other contracts do, but Sorry. we've, but is that right? But we've decided to extend the conversation and all the calculations to all the unions because we or somebody decided it wouldn't be fair to look at just one. 
Is that kind that's, of that's my understanding. That's okay, my understanding. but the only, but, the only obligation, the only obligation you have to review a cost of living adjustment mm -hmm. is written into the police contract. Right. So I guess one thing I'm wondering, and I think that it quite possibly can't be discussed in this meeting, but I'm wondering if there was, a, because I don't like this conversation. It comes up, it puts us in an adver adversarial position relative to the police department, and I don't like that. Um, and I'm wondering if there was any conversation during the last contract negotiations of taking that out. And I'm sure you can't answer that in this in this setting. Um, but it seems to me that 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 we wouldn't be able to take the town would not be able to take that out unless we put something else in because of the give and take that always happens in a negotiation. So there's value to the police in having this in their contract and it's not in anyone else's. Um, and all, all the contracts contain different provisions. I've never heard anyone say, gee, you know, um, this contract gives everybody something or other, and we better give that to everybody else because that's fair. I mean, we don't have that conversation. So to me, I don't think it's necessary to extend what we're looking at now to the other unions. I'm sure that's an unpopular thing to say, but I, I would be inclined to follow what's in the contracts, which is that we look at it for the police, first of all. Um, secondly, I'm wondering now that we're looking at um, different ways that other towns have structured this, depending on retirement date, depending on age and things like that, I'd be interested in hearing if perhaps, um, Lieutenant Hawking, if anybody's talked about doing something like making a suggestion for something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you answer that? Yeah. I mean, I've been retired for 10 years, but what I can tell you is that um, a lot of the cycles that I was involved in the union negotiations, um, like it was like, like almost like the ground rules for, we got this in our, this was many, many years ago. And for cycle after cycle after cycle, we were told, don't even bring up the pension type thing. I mean, we, you know, when they say we're locked out right now, I think they're locked out till 2024 few years or something like that. We've been kind of locked out for a long time, just in the way it, it, it proceeded. But um, as far as, you know, the COLAs and stuff, the the spreadsheet you have from Millman shows, I think it's Woodbridge, who's part of MERS. And I pointed out at the pension committee, it's a little misleading. They only show five departments with COLAs. I mean, MERS itself has 27 departments in it. The fact that they only showed one, you know, like saying, oh, hey, it's not very common. There's only five departments getting COLAs. Um, I, 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 did, I did my own search. What is MERS? It's the Municipal it's Employee the Retirement right. System. Right. Okay. Uh, we, we had actually tried to get into that a couple times. But Sorry, thank you. I know less than the fire department. But anyways, and, you know, there's like Orange in particular. Um, you know, Mitch is a selectman there. They, they bargained uh, for two. They get 2% a year guarantee mm -hmm. um they you know that was all that was something that i'm pretty sure it was when they went to the 401k as part of the you know to get it so to speak and, and i'm just speaking on from what i was told from a retired orange officer you're that, correct that, that that was kind of the negotiation like right? we'll give the retirees a two percent cola every year if you go to the 401k i mean that happened in guilford i didn't see that on the <laughs> on the agenda, but that's kind of how every, I mean, everybody negotiates. I mean, well, well, they, they, like, they, like Sue said, we don't, we're not able to cherry pick from anybody else's contract. And this is the only time I've been in on, you know, 1980s when I started on the town, I've never seen anybody been allowed to cherry pick from another person's, another union's benefit plan. You know, it was always, well, they have that, you don't, uh, yeah, obviously, if that was the case, everybody would want medical, you know, but that doesn't happen. So, don't need to so the Sue's point, which you know, I'll let you jump yeah. back in, it, it is an uncomfortable discussion. It's slightly adversarial. It, it, and I think some of this does make more sense in the contract negotiation process, which is by definition an adversarial process, a controlled adversarial process. But nonetheless, there's conflicting interests. Uh, in order to make a decision as to what makes sense in a situation where a lot of folks 
are retiring early and or have second jobs. I mean, the piece of missing piece of information to me, a big piece of missing information, is what are the economics of the people who are in that slot from 48 mm -hmm. to 68 and what they're outside. I mean, you know, if I was being absolutely hard nosed about it, I'd be like, okay, you're telling me that this is a struggle. What are the outside resources? Now, that's not appropriate for today. It may or may not be appropriate in the context of a of a contract negotiation, but it's certainly a piece of information that would inform which way the town the town goes. And and you know that that may change everybody's analysis of how hard they push for stuff. If it's like, okay, fine, I've got to disclose my outside assets and earnings. That's an interesting piece of news, but it would change this, the decision making process for sure. But again, that's not for today. Someday, maybe in a, a union negotiation that comes up. That's half directed at you, Jeff. I don't mean to be talking to you, Mitch, but the, the, there's a lot of information that we're trying to process without having it right in front of us here for today's purposes. To, to answer your question and back to Jeff, uh, you know, we don't, I don't uh, keep track necessarily of what people do after they leave here. Yeah. Uh, what I try to keep track of is their email addresses and their, and their uh, phone numbers and their, and their addresses so we can make sure we get the information out to them when we contact them. Uh, either on pension or medical, I try to keep up with the most current information. But as far as what they do, a lot of them will disclose it because they're proud of the fact they're, they've got another yeah. job or don't. They mm -hmm. want to just retire and spend time in another state or with the family. That's certainly a personal decision for each of them. Back to Jeff's point about the, the Orange police, he is, I believe, correct about it was negotiated when Orange uh, went to a 401 way back in the year 2000. The police, the current police officers who retired after 2000, and only those after 2000 uh, did and still do receive a 2% annualized uh, cost of living adjustment. Uh, but to be fair, when the um, current police officers uh, who are now in the 401, when that negotiation came up around 2014, that was also the time that the police office, the current police officers uh, negotiated a 2.25% um, multiplier from 2% on their on their uh, their pensions, which significantly increased their their initial pension, mm -hmm. regardless of a COLA. Uh, so I mean, you know, it's give and take in every negotiation. Sue, to be honest with you, the town has not um, gone into negotiations looking to remove that paragraph. Mm -hmm. It's been there. It's kind of a, you know, been there forever kind of thing, not yeah. one that we've, we've touched. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, yes, there's a quote unquote lockout, if you will, about discussing pension until the year 2024. It was a 10 year uh, lockout that was agreed to in the negotiations that was put forth pretty much by the officers who felt they didn't want to see things degrading any further uh, from the town, uh, increased contribution rates or anything else. And so uh, as part of the overall negotiations, that was agreed to. And that's why we are where we are. So, the, so the last couple of negotiations, there's going to be no discussion of pension whatsoever based on that agreed to uh, lockout for ten years. Okay, thank you. To Susan's point about this annual or semi-annual uh, uncomfortable conversation, what options do we have going forward? We have to make a decision about what's on the table now, but. What options do we have going forward to either, you know, set some precedent or set something or whatever? I mean, is it reopening? The, it's not reopening the contract, but... Well, the next contract negotiations will be after that lockout period. If the town at that time feels there's... So a we have no options between now and between 2024 to set up some procedure to avoid this conversation. Correct. Correct. I mean, so to, to, we could establish a policy. This board could establish the policy and, and grant something. Um, and what is your reaction then to Susan's point about not necessarily having to do it for all of the unions? I, I don't know. I'm not a retiree. I don't know how the other, I'm sure the other retirees would not feel. Um, very, very, Great. very, very happy about that, especially because the average, I don't have it in front of me, but I know the average, um, you know, retiree pension for those folks are as much less than what the police is. And so they could make the same 
you, know, you have somebody here sitting here from the town retirees making the same point and well, coming, coming get, back I, to you. Uh, of course, I can you. appreciate that, you know, yeah. the retirees perspective. Yeah. What about Susan's perspective that, you know, it's not necessarily apples to apples? It's no. not apples to apples because you have, a, you have one contract that does call it out. You also have a precedent, which you can always change, that would ever, to my knowledge, uh, in my research, way back before I was here, it seems that every time a COLA was granted to the police retirement fund, the same amendments to the, the, the uh, pension plans were made to the non-certified Board of Ed, as well as the town employees pension plans. Um, so if there was so if there was a five percent thought out there was a five percent or a ten percent cost of living adjustment, it was the, the change was made across the board. So you know, no, there has not, as has been well documented, there's not been any cost of living adjustment since two thousand eight, but it's been none for all three. And so it you can you have the discretion, obviously, it's mm -hmm. your call. But I mean. You know, it depends on how you feel about your other retirees out there and whether you feel it's fair to, you know, do for one group, not the other. Whether you fair, feel it's fair, as Sue is suggesting, to, to pick a, a, an age or a date of retirement or an amount somebody makes. I mean, that's, that's really, you know, getting into the weeds, but it's also yeah. going to be, and, yeah. where, where do you draw the line? It's see, that, that's the struggle I have now. I mean, here we are in a negotiation, really. <laughs> Uh, of something that we have a pension committee for. I mean, you know, maybe our message, you know, is to send this back to pension committee to, to come up with a plan so that we're not having this discussion. You know, I, I don't know if it's a reopening or a policy decision or something, but I, I don't feel that, you know, I don't want to micromanage them. And, and, you know, those are the individuals that, you know, I uh, have to address the numbers. I mean, the impact on the taxpayers. I can appreciate the impact on the retirees. Mm -hmm. Struggle with the, you know, the, the point that it hasn't changed in so many years. But I also, you know, taxpayers are going to put the bill. You know, I, so that's that's what the yeah. Millen report is 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 provided for you, and it, and that's by I think by law, anytime there's an adjustment made to, any this would this would create a plan amendment. Anytime there's an amendment to a pension plan, we have to get an actuarial study done. So this is a natural, you know, if you well, want to What do you do with the study is my point. And, you know, I, I think that's what we have a pension committee for. And I can appreciate their recommendation here. And it's probably based on more of what's happening in the, in the market and in the, in the fund. Uh, but I do think it's their responsibility. We should respect their decision. But I, I think sending a message back to them that, uh, to Susan's point, this is, you know, you got to find a path forward for both the retirees and for the taxpayers. Right. And, and this annual negotiation yeah. is just inappropriate. No, it's just one point that you make about, you know, first of all, the, you, you have the minutes of the, uh, of the pension committee. I'm not going to read them for you. But the discussion you, you brought up and Sue has indicated about, trying to parse the pension um, cost of living adjustment was discussed, not this time. Uh, it might have been brought up in passing. Mm -hmm. There was an extensive discussion, if it wasn't two years ago, maybe four years ago, about, and there was a back and forth about, you know, and that was the, the problem was, where do you draw the line? Because if you say somebody retired before 1990, and the person who retired in 1991. But, but that's the point they're trying to make is this is not the forum to have that in-depth conversation. But when they had that conversation, they came up with it's got, they they didn't they didn't want to make that decision. Well, they didn't appreciate the, the pension committee. They didn't, feel like, they didn't want to, but you know, well, that's their job. Well, well, their job came back to say we sh we feel it's going to go or nothing. In this case, it was nothing. And that, that's, you know. this time, okay, and uh, and I can appreciate you know the why for of this time or that time. Uh, but you know we got you know there's got to be a longer term fix for this, and you know I I can appreciate the retirees' position, mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, I, they make a lot of valid arguments, and it's been a long time, but it's an incredibly sympathetic group, um, and and as you say, making 
good arguments, but it's balanced by the impact on the town, which is why it lands in this conference yes. room. That's right. Um, it makes it hard. But back to the Mitch, your, yeah, sorry. I think it's your form. Maybe it was Millman. It's labeled Mitch. Um, so the proposed change number two, just to the police grid. Yeah. And just to the, the proposed, I presume the proposed change number two is what happens at 60 Correct. percent. And so that's $101,000 per year that would add on to the budget over the, essentially, over uh, 20 years. Drops off on the back end. I'm presuming that's just the actuarial impact on lives. Yeah. Right? I'm not sure, but yeah, at the very end, yes, it's drop the, off. the number of <laughs> you know, supposed. Uh, Yes, yeah, it's just that's the hard, the hard calculation of of an actuary, right? Um, yeah, I mean the problem, the, the thing that concerns me, like at one level, I'm thinking to myself, one hundred one thousand dollars, it's not a catastrophe. I mean, you can figure out a way to absorb yeah, that. It's it happened. The problem is, like, we'd be visiting it every two years, yeah. and then facing yeah, the same it, dilemma. It, it's like in two years from now, fresh is, water, just, fresh is going to be just as bad. So one time doesn't seem insurmountable but it's the it's the cumulative effect if it, if it kept happening it would be which is why over 35 years or 40 years now in this country there's been such an assault on pensions from business and from, from all sides right i mean a lot of people sort of came to the conclusion that as a society we're not going to do that Municipal pensions and police well, pensions. At least you got to pay it for. I mean, you know, one of the last the, places. The new accounting practice and everything. You got to, got to be part of the calculation. Got to be funded. <laughs> got to be funded. And uh, I gotcha. And that's the reality. And that's why, you know, the the hard decisions on both sides of this lie with this board. Uh, but you know, we do have these committees set up, and they're supposed to get into the weeds and get a fix. And yeah, I, not to or not to argue with you, Charles, but the pension committee has a very, very limited yeah. score and charge. Um, and Pete and I have actually had this conversation because the very thought of having the pension committee um, manage the pay uh, process, right, is one that we can't find any substantiation for in the creation of the pension committee. Um, so it, it, I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to pump it to them, quite honest with you. Right. Um, well, I can appreciate that, that, you know, we're not asking them, we, we probably have not asked them or directed them to make the philosophical decisions just to manage the dollars of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably where you're going. And I, and I can appreciate that. Uh, but if that's the case, then I, as a member of this board, uh, to lose point, there's a lot of information here that's got to be digested, not something you just do in a half hour meeting. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, so to, that, to that point, and Lou had actually said something some of this earlier, uh, do we want to table this, for this at this point while we gather more information uh, and possibly do a workshop uh, specific for this issue as a board? Yeah, I think it, the, you know, the, to Susan's point, you know, this has got to get resolved and just whether it be a policy decision or something, but this this is just going on too long, you know, both from the retiree's perspective and the town's perspective. Mm -hmm. Find an answer. Okay. I like that idea. Right. I mean, I think a motion to table it so we can gather more information and make a potentially longer term decision. Yeah. So, so before before you make a motion to table specifically, we don't have a motion on We don't have a motion on oh, be, Before you do, <laughs> say before you, and it's not debatable. What information in particular that you don't already have are you looking for? Because I'm sure it's well, that's what we got to get okay. Yeah, they're in a workshop or something to figure out. Ooh, well, I, I don't have all my questions lined up, yeah. but I know there's a lot more. I think you start by having a discussion with the pension committee and what do they know that we don't know. Like to my I'd be interested in the information I mentioned, which is without having names associated yeah. with it, interested in the spreadsheet showing what the benefits amount what the benefit amounts are date of retirement and the age of the person at this moment yeah. not having names makes it a lot cleaner and a lot easier to digest raw data yeah and i and i'd like to know from the perspective of the group of retirees um what might be acceptable in terms of 
you know, sort of parsing out date of birth, date of retirement, something like that, that might sort of get us to a compromise. I'd also like to see, and I, I think this may just be extrapolation, but if we chose a percentage that was not, you know, 100% or 60%, if we chose a lesser percent, what that would do to the numbers. And, and there's nothing to suggest that we couldn't establish a policy that said there's a recurring uh, COLA adjustment for the next uh, couple of years. You said, uh, you know, we could do, you know, one of the, what if some of these are 1%, 2%, 3%. Uh, right. And, and, so, those are, and those are apparently built into some form of contractual obligation, right? Mm -hmm. So we could we could mirror that even without the contract. Mm -hmm. um, I think we well, have. Well, that's right. I think yeah. we got to talk to Pete too and see yeah. what we can do. All right, so we'll schedule, we'll schedule a workshop. Yeah. Jeff, can I just make one comment? Sure. Um, just regarding what we are talking about here, um, and I'll go back to two years ago, there is a part of that language in the contract is, and this is my personal opinion and just some of the retirees, that it, it's been this year, it was three months. It, we, we lost three months at the pension board, which if you read the language, they're not even really part of the process. They're part of this language is to jet, you know, ask for the report, which Mitch has done as long as I've known. Ask for the report. Report comes to the selectmen. The selectmen reviews it. Maybe they, they get their report, the Q&A to Billion, and makes a decision. This started in April. April, they didn't have a quorum. May, they tabled it. June, we're now past the 90-day limit to make a decision. The report came out April 12th. We're July 18th. Two years ago, I asked for this to be um, because it was the whole, it was COVID, it was, you know, <clears throat> everything was going on. And we had a letter from the union. We asked to be to postpone it. And it, basically the select board said, no, nope, we got to make a decision within 90 days, and they denied us. So here we are two years later saying, oh, let's get a committee together and all this stuff. I just think it's at this point. Um, this 90 days has really, it's gone off the tracks at the pension committee. My, again, this is this is me talking. And if you look at, I know what you're saying, Charlie, but if you look at the, the makeup of that board, I mean, that's not the most glorified board. Um, and I've, I've gone back and looked at the minutes over the year. There's, it's very uh, unusual to even have the same people on the board. That there's a big turnover. So the people that made a, a recommendation a month ago may not have been around. I mean, the, the one guy that had most of the question, this was his first meeting, you know, he, he was brand new, had, you know, really no history of anything. So, you know, the people that make comments, you know, the pension board in 2010, 2012, 2014, and so on, it's not the same people. It's not as cohesive as a lot of the, like the board of finance, for, for example, there, there's a lot of consistency there where people are, uh, they're on, you know, multiple, multiple years so that this whole, hey, this is, you know, what they, you know, they're charged, so to speak, you know, where it, it almost seems like when you read, the minutes are very, uh, even those minutes, and if you watch the tape, it's, it's a whole different thing. A lot of the discussion that came out on, if you listen to the tape, is not in, in print, so. Well, I think that's just, the Matt's point, you know. I think we've already had basic consensus here that we're not going to punch it back to them, but by the same token, they do have some responsibility to do some of the research and that type of thing, even if it's just a numbers thing. That part of it is part of the calculation because there is an impact on the tax rate. So that part, oh, you know, I understand. It's a, it's a, it's a just point, and I clearly understand your frustration with the inflational pace that governmental activities uh, <laughs> take place at. Um, but I don't think you want to demand a vote today I'm on not, whether we do this or not. I'm, I'm not demanding. No, I'm just, I know, I'm just making a point of not, yeah, it's 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 your it worked the other way two yeah. years ago right. that we had to vote because we were closing in on the 90 days. Right. Now, all of a sudden, right. it's not a big deal. Uh, again, what's the 90 day provision? Mitch? Well, it says in the uh, it, once again, this is from the police contracts. So the Board of Selectmen shall vote on any such proposed adjustment within 90 days from the date of its receipt of the report from the actuary. So we can get another report from an actuary. In well, with this, to, 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 Jeff, to Jeff's point, he is correct. The original the original um, report from the actuary, I think, was dated in April. Right. 
all right? But that's been pushed aside. I, only, I didn't want to confuse you any more than you already confused and only gave you the one from June 9th because the, the, oh. it was the pension committee that requested a breakdown, which the first report did not have by the different groups. So Milliman, Jen Castellano from Milliman went back to the drawing board and came up with a more, much more detailed report dated June 9th. So, we'll okay, so you could say you're within 90 June. days of the June. Yeah. You're not within 90 days of the April report. You are within 90 days of the June report, which, by the way, was then looked at on June 15th by the um, by the pension committee. So, you know, once again, um, it brought the report from the actuary. There are two of them now. So the first one, you're outside the 90 days. The second one, you're still within. So it's Perfect. I don't know. And Pete's listening intently. I know she's probably. <laughs> so, all right. So, I, at this point, um, there's other information that the folks would like to have at their disposal when we convene on this topic as a in a workshop fashion. Um, please forward it along to the bench. Yep. Uh, you take some notes. I, I take. So. Well, I, I definitely want. I'll definitely put together a spreadsheet, if you will, from from our records. Um, you know, of the for, we, for the police of the uh, current benefit, the age of the individual, and the date of retirement of the individual. Yeah. And I'll just, you yeah, know, thank you. Just to uh, go back to a point that was made earlier a couple of times, and that's the lumping in of police and the other two at yeah. the same time. Um, and I know uh, folks have expressed their sentiments, um, and I might as well add mine to that list. And owing to the fact that um, the retirement package that the police department uh, has negotiated is substantially healthier than the other two, I have long thought that there was there needed to be some level of equity in how we treat our retired employees. Uh, so my own personal perspective, and that's why I think that I've always framed this in terms of we need to look at everybody, uh, is that um, the, uh, unfortunately, the less advantage continue to have less advantages if we only uh, take a look at one. It doesn't mean I am, you know, not willing to do, you know, anything one or or, or two or three, uh, but I think that should be part of the overall discussion because that's more a philosophical yeah. uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just wanted that to uh, clarify. And Mitch, to just make to that's very point there the charts that you have prepared here or uh, that are attached to the Millman letter. Excuse me. Those are, those are not prepared by me, they're prepared by Millman. I keep saying Mitch. That's all right. so I, mean, I provided them to you, but I didn't, I didn't put them together. Uh, I will put together the next one. The they're very helpful. So it's, uh, there's the county employees pension plan. That's here, public works. Uh, not public, public works. works is, 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 is in a Teamsters plan. So oh, they're so totally they're separate, but that includes um, basically all other other full-time employees other than police and the Teamsters. What about fire? Fire is included in that. Fire, the, the fire is included in this town and the town of employees. employees. Yeah. Okay, that's what I was, that's my question. So yeah. that, that first chart includes fire. The one that says town employees includes fire, dispatchers, GEA, Guilford Employee Association, Great. Guilford Supervisor Association, and the uh, contracted individuals. Uh, and for those familiar with some of the negotiations with the fire department, um, it's, it's it's around the corner uh, that they're going to ask for the same level of benefits they already have consistently had. Uh, and one can certainly understand they make a similar contention about the danger that they face in their everyday uh, lives and work, too. So um, let's not forget that the, this probably won't be the last time we hear about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, to your point about the other arena, you know, we're a community and just that spirits, I think you have to consider. Okay. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you. Thank Jeff, you. thanks for your interactions. Uh, so I'm um, so this is your workshop. Yeah, we're gonna pull something together. Uh, but we'll 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 clue you. We'll uh, right. give you notes. it would be a workshop and then it will come back to we'll pull back. Thank you. Okay. End of the workshop, public. Yeah, all of our meetings. Okay.
Okay, item eight, uh, discuss to take possible action on an ordinance to amend the town, uh, code of the town of Guilford, chapter 208 noise, and an ordinance to regulate ATV and other motorized vehicles. Let's take these one at a time. Is there a motion to approve the ordinance to amend the town code of uh, Guilford, chapter 208 noise? I'll move. Is there a second? Well, I'm happy to second, but I, I, I am impressed with Sue's question about yep. exempting lawn mowing specifically right boy i can make a distinction between a lawn mower and a leaf blower right um i i'm i'm comfortable taking out the uh, lawn equipment um i would i would explicitly say lawn mower oh well yeah. trying to trying to find that where exactly is that yeah, so, yeah. so i think it was the, number four number three number three Great. sorry there you go so, so if we were to strike lawn and garden tools. So leave it as an exemption with no exception in the exemption. Yep. Oh, yeah. Pete, does that pass muster? I, I'm sorry, an alarm just went off for me, so I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, I have a doctor's appointment a half hour. How so, many decibels was it? <laughs> 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 um, lawyers guns and money there you go. <laughs> um, all right so the uh so not to be uh short on that but the domestic power equipment so you know you could do a couple of things you could approve the pro proposed amendment uh with respect to um section e as to paragraphs one and five only or you know you could try to preserve it for some domestic power equipment but not others but that's going to get a little dicey there. Uh, to Sue's point, lawnmower. Now, do we take out weed whacker and leaf blower? You know, leaf blower. Um, so, and uh, let me just tell you something too about um, noise ordinances in general. They have to be approved by uh, DEEP, um, and they, and that particular agency, are very. Um, uh, they like to see noise restrictions, the more the better. So if we were to go forward with any part of this, it's harder to undo it once we do it. Uh, it's hard to get approval for in increasing noise than it is uh, to change an ordinance that's gonna restrict noise. So the reason I'm saying that is if we have any, if we're gonna have any second thoughts, if we're gonna pass this, or you're going to pass this as respect to domestic power equipment. And then we think, oh, gee, we went a little too far. And now we want to mm -hmm. back it up a little bit. Right. Uh, that could be difficult. So so, so that, that suggests taking that whole section out on domestic power equipment. Yeah. And, and, and leave the exception in the original, right? Yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah. It isn't as if, you know, the police are going to be going around measuring you know, neighborhood. it's going to be based on someone's complaint, complaint right you mm -hmm. know and they this is just giving them some horsepower to deal with a complaint so and actually as you you know as you guys were talking about this earlier i think one of the multitasks i do is i'll like i jumped on the phone with uh, butch or i i'll contact chris hodgson on some of these other issues and so the chief basically said th these are very hard to enforce anyway Mm -hmm. Lawn mowers moving around, and, and you don't have a stable um, noise pattern <clears throat> that you can measure. And there's a question of how far away. So, um, you know, uh, certainly that's that's doesn't strike me. And it's up to you folks. Doesn't strike to me as a very important part of this ordinance change. So it would stay in place for after ten. Ten's the hard cut off that they stand yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Which so, so, so we're going to strike the changes to section three. Yeah, I think what your motion would be, if you wanted to um, modify it, would be to pro, pro, approve the proposed amendment to the noise ordinance with respect to section 208.5e exemptions as to paragraph one and five only. I'll make that motion. Lou, 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 Lou just made that motion. We'll second that. Any further comments or discussion? Hearing none, let me try your mind. Select woman, Renner. Aye. Those in the room, all right, uh, all right. that passes unanimously. Thanks. Uh, the next up is an ordinance to regulate all terrain vehicles and other motorized recreational vehicles. Is there a motion? Uh, For purposes of discussion. Yeah, I'll move it. And I'll second. second. Sorry, so uh, 
Okay. Um, comments or questions? So, you know, we, we, in, in the earlier discussion, we talked about moving on this and then doing something subsequent with regard to pickup trucks and registered vehicles. Yeah. Right? Does that still make sense? I think it does. I yeah, think. I think it does. But well, it's definitely a risk, and that would be really damaging to have a full size, you know, motor vehicle yeah. in these trails. No. I think the full, well, no, we, like, yeah, what we, we caught my eye was that the, the penalties for a registered vehicle appear to be generally less than what we're proposing here. So I would certainly want to bring them up to at least that's the same, the same, but it's a separate right, function. I, um, I'll, if you like, uh, you know, I could, we could do a little research on that front. I just want to throw this out there for your general consideration at that point is, is you know, registered motor vehicles by the very term of it, they're regulated. They're registered with the state. They're heavily regulated by state law. And, you, you know, we've been down this road occasionally, not often, where there's a question about preemption uh, when state law enters a field and regulates it strictly, how much can the town then supplement that and go beyond what the state has state regulations have provided? So, so here um, we have specific, and Tom could you know answer questions on this, but we do have specific enabling statutes by the legislature which said uh, towns are empowered to make their own ordinances around ATVs and dirt bikes, very specific statutes. And they, they, they do not include doing the same for registered motor vehicles. So we would have to determine whether or not we have general municipal authority to regulate in that field. And I have to tell you, it, it, I'm not sure that we do, but we could research that. So, so two things I'm hearing you say, does it make sense to try and fold it into this yes. ordinance? Number one, number yes. two, I think it was mentioned somebody brings a four wheel drive Jeep, picking on Jeep, um, into one of these trails. They're trespassing and they're potentially violating other but state statutes. But trespassing statutes, and that's a litigation issue. In, uh, well, the, the fines could the, be litigated too. Right, but they're nowhere near what these fines are. Right. These are serious. Offenses. Well, I, I don't know what the fines are. For the first offense. I got it. But the so, first event is going to get thrown out of court. So I'm curious, what would happen if somebody and then the high is on? What would happen if you found the, the, the truck driving off the trail on the Timberlands? The first time trespass, it won't even get through court. It won't even get to court. I, I don't know if that's the case, Charlie. Yeah, if no, you're talking about right. a registered motor vehicle trespassing yeah. on somebody's property? Yes. The yes. town's property. Particularly on the trip. Particularly on the trails, uh, I, I talked to people about this earlier, particularly on the trails, if somebody's in a registered vehicle, trespassing and criminal mischief are right off the top are two charges that would be uh, added, uh, you know, depending on what kind of damage they've done there, whether they've damaged a gate or other entry area or done damage to the trail itself, ruts, things like that. So those two charges would automatically come into play. Some of the yeah. things that we consider, particularly when we were looking at the, the, the statute is uh, I think we need to remember a lot of times uh, the people that are riding these dirt bikes and ATVs and not always, but m most of the time are juveniles or young adults. Uh, and a lot of times they don't have the ability to have a registered vehicle. They're driving these unregistered vehicles in those areas, uh, you know, and with with no driver's license or, or no vehicle registered to them. So, uh, you know, we would take the registered vehicles. And those would automatically go to court. And, uh, you know, now you've got a situation where somebody would have to fight that in court. Certainly fines could be uh, levied. And even in this case, uh, if fines are levied at the town level on the ordinance, people still have the ability to challenge that, fight that, uh, that, uh, that charge with the town. All right, so I think it makes sense. We're going to move this one forward. Yeah. Pete's going to do the legal research to determine what kind of authority we have to regulate uh, registered vehicles on the same type of front additionally, so uh, so that we're not uh, violating state statutes. Um, okay, so uh, second. Moved, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Let me try your mind. Select woman Renner. Aye. Those in a room? Aye. 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 That motion passes in the end. So thanks, Pete, and thanks, Tom. You're welcome. Your work on it.
Uh, item nine, consider and take possible action on a resolution for a sustainable materials management grant from the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, as a, a little way of background, uh, you can see we secured a grant uh, of $83,444 uh, from DEP. Actually, this is part of our South Central Regional Council of the Governance uh, and, uh, initiative on uh, a couple of things, uh, pay as you throw and food waste uh, diversion. This is specific for a food waste diversion program where they, we will identify a hauler uh, who will come and take away uh, food waste. People will uh, people will have the opportunity to sign up with this hauler where you can segment your food waste from your regular garbage um, at no cost to the town. Um, so this is uh, Pete and I talked about this. Uh, it has been suggested to us that we. Uh, you know, just passed a resolution in support of this. Um, so, uh, we'll, any comments or questions? I, I, I'm smiling because this just circles back to, I mean, when I was the proverbial when I was a kid story. <laughs> you know, we lived in a row house in the city, and they literally, the South Jersey pig farmers would come drive it through and collect your buckets of, of food waste. It was incredible. It was incredibly efficient, is what it was. Right. My boy just moved to Brooklyn, and they require all of this. <laughs> well, you separate everything and it's all going to be spelled out. The numbers are staggering that they're passing around that 40% of solid waste is related to food waste mm -hmm. because it, it, it's moist and it absorbs moisture. So, um, just the you know, taking a significant part of uh, that out of play. These materials wind up at uh, you know, the facility in Southern uh, where they are processing. Uh, the food waste diversion and turning it into energy. Uh, quantum biophysics is the out uh, is the out there. Oh, the food is used yeah. for, that, for, for that purpose. Right? Interesting. Yeah. Do Do we know how it's processed? I'm just curious. What happens? Uh, no, I, I I missed that chapter in my science mm -hmm. class. Um, I, I I don't. There's a there, there's a it really it, take a look at this outfit called quantum biophysics in Sullington. So. Okay. All right. Good. Wow. Good. Yeah. So, I, what's the, what is I need a motion to approve the resolution? I'd like to make that motion. A second. And any further comments or questions? It just bears repeating. It's a 100% it's grant by deep. Deep. We don't have much to, and it makes sense right. to head this way and to educate folks. And for those of us whose memories are still acute, to have deep giving us money for a change, <laughs> it's a little <laughs> different than where we were at some time ago. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Be careful. So let me try your mind. Uh, select one runner. Aye. Uh, those in the room. Aye. 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 Uh, that motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, item 10. <laughs> Discuss to take possible action on noise control variance application for the New England Taco Festival taking place July 30th, 31st. At the agricultural uh, fairgrounds, is there a motion? I'll make a motion to uh, approve that request for a variance. And so I'll second. Second. Any comments or questions? Let me try your mind. Select one. Uh, Renner. Aye. Those in the room. Aye. Aye. Uh, that motion carries. Uh, I'm eleven. Wait, did five to seven thousand people? Oh, yeah. it was it was crazy last year. The place was at that park lot was as packed as uh wow. as anything on a fair day. Well, yeah, impressive. It really is. Um, okay. Um, consider and take uh, possible action or proclamation declaring August 6, 2022, as National Purple Heart Day in the town of Guilford. Larry, August 6th. 7th. 7th? Okay. August 7th. There you've been patiently sitting here. Who's who's getting lunch ready? Right? Yeah, no, it's been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Good or bad. <laughs> well, I pay taxes on three houses, so I mean I'm interested in what you guys are doing. There you go. There you it's, go. it's it's deliberative act. I don't think very good. <laughs> I'm informed. Well, it's good to see you. Okay. Um Right yeah, we're at the uh, consider take possible election and proclamation declaring August 7th, 2022 as a National Purple Heart Day in the town of Gilbert. Larry, you want to talk a little bit about this? It's um, 
yeah, just nationally, they they um, it's been a national holiday for uh, for a few years, and I just thought I'd bring it out to you know you don't hear much about it, um, but um, it's uh, yeah it's honoring Purple Heart recipients okay. uh, mainly for that people. Of course, the Purple Heart's given not only to um, people that uh, are living, but there's also people that are for life and service too also so there that's it there's a there's a you know there's a purple heart organization like the veterans of foreign wars or the american legion um that was first established in ansonia and that's by an act of congress it is a uh veterans considered a veterans organization military order of purple heart uh There's a ceremony that was originally, yeah, originally established in Ansonia, which there is a uh, celebration there for that. Uh, this uh, sat Saturday, I believe it is, I'm going to be representing the town there. I see you got that letter on there. So that's uh, so just a way to get people out there to know that uh, it's another another day like Veterans Day or anything that you, you want to go out there and thank your veterans and, and Honor. There's a lot of Purple Heart recipients, a lot of people that were wounded and, and uh, in all our past wars that live here in Guilford. It's a way of you know recognizing them and letting them know that um, that you know we're thinking about. It. Do we have a list of Purple Heart recipients here in town? Yeah. Is there any way to get that kind of information? Because you know, it'd be nice to send them you know, send them a notification. In fact, I'm sure you, you're going to get the word. Yeah, out well, yeah, I, I know a lot of people. I don't know unless people tell years ago, I could tell you, that. Yeah. you know, because the town was obviously smaller and, the, the, you know, nowadays, I, I don't really know. I, I meet people all the time that, that served overseas and that were wounded. And, uh, but no, I do not have a list of that. There is a registry. There's a Purple Heart Museum, which I visited. Um, Two weeks ago, it's in New York. The town in New York, it's at, uh, uh, I don't remember, I think it's like Windsor. And that's the Purple Heart Museum. It has all, it's a registry. It's a nice museum. They have a lot of artifacts in, in there, but also you can register um, your name there as a Purple Heart recipient. Like they have, I'm sending in an article of the original Shoreline newspaper article when I was wounded. And, um, uh, but you send that your name, and, and so you can go there and find out who they are. Right, okay. yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of things like that going on. But I'm trying to just make a little more awareness of it in town. We have a per I, I purchased a Purple Heart flag that also um, I, don't, I don't know if you have any objection to that, but I figured underneath the American flag, we'll probably uh, switch the uh, POW flag for a week or so prior to that. And we'll fly that underneath the American. Flag. That, that sounds fun. And as, and as you know, we've been flying the Ukrainian flag. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's right. We, can, we can certainly put this uh, up for a week's time. Yeah, maybe we'll just, just a week before. I'll see if I can get it. I'd like to see if we can get a, maybe an article in the, the, uh, the paper. Also. Well, Probably. Ben, ben Rayner from the Gilbert Courier is uh, on this call. So, oh, she uh, is. Oh, okay. yeah, ben, ben is uh, he's down the right hand corner there. Uh, yeah, so maybe if. Maybe if uh, ben, if we could get something in the paper, maybe a picture of with the proclamation yes. yep. and, and some some article, um, that would be good. And, uh, it definitely, that can be done. And is this Larry speaking now? Yes, it is. Um, would it be possible to give me some contact? Do you feel comfortable giving me a phone number over this platform? Or oh, well, yeah, everybody, plastered plaster all over town. You can call. Would you like to give it to me now, or give it if if I can get a contact, that would be great. Then I'll but I'll get I'll work on that. Okay. okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, there's a motion uh, on the table. Um, let me try your mind. Select woman Renner. Aye. Those in the room. Aye. 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 The motion carries. Larry, thank you very much. No, thank you. Uh, let me know about the. Uh, 
from the newspaper and all. Yeah, I'll get you. I, I, what I'll do is, what I usually do is I'll throw an email together introducing the two of you and throw phone numbers because I have cell phone numbers for both of you. So yeah. we'll do that a little bit later. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. <laughs> hey, lunch going to be late today? What? What lunch? Meals on wheels. No, they can send out. <laughs> well, they're all set. They're all set. There you go. It's a well-oiled machine over there, right? Uh, okay. Uh, appointments and resignations. Uh, Mr. Connell. What's that? Mr. Connell. Yep. 12. one. Act on a recommendation to appoint Peter Connell as an alternate to the Marina Commission to fill a vacancy for a term to expire June 30th, 2025. Is there a motion? I'll make a uh, second. I'll second it. Um, uh, any comments or questions? Yeah, I'm just just wondering. Um, the agenda states uh, to act on a recommendation. Where was the recommendation from? Trace. Trace I, there was an. I got an email from Tim Donlin from the Republican Town Committee. I thought I included it in your board packet. Oh, I, I, mean, I apologize I'm, I'm if sorry. I didn't. No, no, no. That's no, I didn't see the email either. I can send it out to you. I'm sorry. I thought I included it. It came from the Republican Town Committee. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, taking a look at his uh, experience, uh, Guilford Youth Mentor for uh, 26 years, Duck Island Yacht uh, Condominium founder, and uh, you know, Duck Island Yacht Club uh, Commodore. So, good. 38 year resident. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Any, uh, uh, is there a motion? I made it. You made it. That's yeah. right. Uh, let me try your minds. Uh, select Woman Renner. Aye. Those in the room? All right. Aye. Bye. Okay. Uh, item 13, request for use of town property. 13.1 act on a request on the Guilford Agricultural Commission to use the green to place a sign on the green advertising its unveiling of the new farm brochure taking place August 20th, 2022. Rain date August 21. Sign placement 8, uh, 6 to 820. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, let me try your mind. Second one, uh, Renner. Aye. Those in the room. Aye. 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 That motion carries unanimously. 13.2, act on a request to place a donated bench on the green with an attached plaque honoring Carl Ballas Tracy. Linda, thank you for your patience. Uh, <laughs> you should have provided coffee. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, so may I say something? Absolutely. Come on up. I, I don't want to be yeah. uh, First of all, I want to thank you for putting this on your agenda, but I also want to thank Ben Rayner. Uh, whom I spoke to over the phone for not putting my name in that article on the front page because I specifically <laughs> told him, do not put my name. <clears throat> there was never the intention that this become a townwide issue. It was, I thought, a valid request to the Green Committee back in September simply for a plaque on a bench that's already there that has nothing. And I was told they changed their policy. And then in May, I wrote first selectman Hoey a letter listing all the reasons that Carl Balistracy deserves the plaque, the small plaque, three by eight inches on, on a bench. So that's what I have to say. Got it. I'd like to move this if nobody else is. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh. You want to move it? Absolutely. Yes. I'll second. So, I uh, Linda, thank you for uh, cl that clarification. And uh, we all uh, hold Carl in very high esteem for what he did in this community. And uh, I'm wholly supportive of this. But I wanted to make some clarifications here. The Green Committee came back and said uh, this is inconsistent with uh, what, what, what they do or their policy. However, uh, Pete and I have had this conversation. Uh, subject to existing policies, laws, and regulations, the Board of uh, Selectmen may consider donor request to place a small donor recognition plaque on donations. The size of the donor recognition uh, recognition plaque shall be determined by the Board of Selectmen at its, in its sole discretion. And you had provided an example of uh, what the plaque was going to read. Uh, and I took the, the opportunity last Friday to walk around the green, and, the, and I, I think your packet includes the pictures I took of other uh, individuals who have been honored uh, with plaques. And, and the donation that's being made by the Ballas Tracy family is one of the new benches 
that's already scheduled to go on to the green that we had approved through the use of our fund. So this is not a new uh, 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 structure or edifice or, you know, um, or, or monument. Uh, this is one of the benches that has been approved by this committee, uh, by this board, as well as the committee to go on the green. So um, I, I'm fully supportive of it. And I can certainly see the consistency of recognizing a, a I'll use lifetime of public service um, to be acknowledged in this way in this public space. Great. I am concur completely. I mean, Carl was a great colleague for many years. And uh, I remember I had to do some research about plaques and things on the green. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think in Carl's possession at some point in time was a lot of plaques. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's no question that there's there's a number of others there and whatever precedent was set. I mean, uh, I would supersede Carl's uh, efforts throughout the years. Really All right. Um, so you're a you're on board. Good. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let me try your minds. Select woman runner. Aye. Those in the room. Aye. 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 That motion passes unanimously. Linda, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much. Welcome. You're welcome. It's good to do the right thing. All right. Item 14, committee reports. I don't think we have any uh, at this point. Um, correspondence. A little astounded. Just real quick. The building permits is 30. On a, in a year that just felt like there was a furious amount of activity. Those are those are those new, are new home new, construction. New home construction. And I recognize we're getting to a point probably faster than many of us think. I mean, somewhere along the way when we were on the Board of Finance, we had a projection of the remaining building lots, and it was shockingly close, decades, right. short decades, not right. a century. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, even the building lots that they're using now are a stretch. But I think it's a reflection of materials and that type of thing, too. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next two or three years as these multi-unit properties, properties. Come or they, would that be one permit? Um, so that number might, be a, little, point. might yeah. be a little, not necessarily change, right. whereas there's going to be 100 units on 100, 100 Road, is right. it one? That's one permit. Okay. Which is, well, maybe, good two, maybe, maybe, maybe two, because there are two separate two structures. Buildings. I mean, the, the ability of creating space we'll, for people to move in. Yeah, Trace, let, we'll go back and, and check with uh, the building department to clarify specifically that this is freestanding uh, uh, household uh, structures, right? Good. Sure. Okay. So, sorry to go off on that. Quite all right. Tangent. All right. Um, all right. Uh, old business? New business? Public forum. Anyone wishing to address the board in public forum? Clear everybody out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, item 19 discuss and take possible action on an appeal from resident accordance with section 247 31, right of appeal, article 7, elderly tax relief program. An uh, executive session may be required, will be required. Is there a motion to go into executive session? I'll make a motion. Second. 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 Uh, let me try your mind. Select woman Renner. Aye. Uh, those in a room? Aye. Aye. Uh, and motion carries. Let's take a health break. Yeah, take a health break as well. Yeah. I move and a second. And a second. Second. Um, there were executive session. There were no motions made, no action taken. Uh, seeing there's no other business, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Try your minds. Select one runner. Aye. Those in a room? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank so, you. Good meeting. So can I just throw out like a, a completely kibitzing suggestion? 